I have to, even though there's nobody here, but <laughs> <laughs> I still had to put it on, even though there's <laughs> So <laughs> I'm calling to order the PVUSD Wednesday, February 27th meeting. <clears throat> Is there any public comments on our closed agenda? Uh, no. Okay. Um, we will now go into closed session and we will have one expulsion referral, good. <laughs> we will have certif certificated public employee employment appointment employment government code section 54957. 2.3 classified public employee appointment employment government code section 54957. 2.4 negotiation, negoti I can't even talk today. I know how to say that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do know how to say that. Negotiations update, 2.5, public employee discipline dismissal release leaves. 2.6, resolution number 18-19-25, possible reassignment or release for certain certificated management employees. 2.7, resolution 18-19-24, non-re-election of certain probationary certificated employees. All right, to close session. Uh, I mean, wait till everybody sits down, I guess. Oh, everybody's making some noise. Okay. <laughs> I'm calling our meeting to order and welcome everyone that has come to be with us tonight and our Wednesday meeting on February 27th. Okay, so I'm going to call, who should I call for the Pledge of Allegiance? How about you? you? <laughs> Danny. I pledge allegiance yes. to, the to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I'm Karen Osmondson, and I'm this year the board president. And if si si alguien que necesita traducciones se puede hablar con Urania, que está ahí, si necesita y se puede conseguir unos aparatos para oír las traducciones. Okay, now I'm going to have Dr. Rodriguez give her comments. Yeah. So, good evening. So, starting next week, I'll begin my conversations with the superintendent during Wednesday staff meetings. I'm holding these conversations with staff in an effort to uh, maintain connection with staff apart from my regular site visits. So both certificated and classified staff will be asked to attend. So a partir de la próxima semana voy a empezar mis conversaciones con la superintendente durante las reuniones del personal escolar los miércoles. Uh, mantengo estas conversaciones con el personal en un esfuerzo para mantener el con la conexión con el personal aparte de mis visitas a la escuela. Um, vamos a invitar al personal certificado y clasificado. So they will be 45 minutes long. For the first 15 minutes, I'll go over district vision, current initiatives, and data. Um, for the following 15 minutes, I'll be leading an activity around our current core values and get additional input on the core values. And then the last 15 minutes, I'll hold a, a question and answer session, and staff will be able to submit their questions on index cards. And I'll answer as many questions as I can in person, and then I promise all other questions will be responded to in writing and provided to the staff. So serán por 45 minutos, durante los primeros 15 minutos voy a repasar la visión del distrito, las iniciativas actuales y los datos 
Durante los siguientes 15 minutos voy a dirigir una actividad alrededor de nuestros valores fun fundamentales actuales y vo vamos a obtener información adicional so sobre los valores principales. Durante los últimos 15 minutos tendré una sesión de preguntas y respuestas. El personal um, va a poder de compartir sus preguntas por escrito en tarjetas. Um, contestaré tantas preguntas que pueda durante ese, persona, o ese tiempo en persona y responderé a todos los demás um, por escrito y vamos a entregar al personal. So I look forward to talking to all the sites over the um, upcoming months. So, it va a ser un placer hablar con todo el personal escolar durante los próximos semanas. So, thank you very much. I want to say a couple of things before I start, or I'm going to start with governing board comments, but I'm going to say a couple of things. Um, one, I just want to say that one of our long-term teachers, one of our wonderful long-term teachers, Mr. Strauss at McQuitty has passed. He was, you know, one day they couldn't, he, he, he's always there, he's never not there and he didn't show up and they were wondering what happened to him and they, they discovered that he had passed. Yes, so if you wanna take a, just a few seconds to Maybe pray for him. <laughs> and the next thing I wanted to do, I just wanted to say that Renaissance High has been designated as a model continuation school. And it's going to be, and it's going to have that award until 2022. I almost think we should clap for them. <laughs> and he was, they were given that award by our state superintendent, Tony Thurmond, which I'm glad he's there. And um, also with the um, California Department of Education. Okay, I'm gonna start with, this time I'm gonna start with Maria in the middle and then we'll go that way and this way. Thank you, Karen. So last week I got the opportunity to attend the DLAC meeting. We received a presentation on the value of being bilingual. It was a very interesting topic with very good discussion with everyone present. Our DLAC parents also received a presentation on the MAP and SBAC assessment and how parents can use this MAP results as a tool to develop strategies for growth and set goals for their students. A concern that was brought up at, the, at this meeting is that not all parents at all schools get their students' MAP scores and or have someone explain the scores to them. I think this needs to be to be changed and would like to ask our administration to look into this. I think all parents and students deserve to have access to their, their scores and explain to them as they highlight not only the student's strengths but also the areas of growth, uh, which can help both students and parents develop improvement plans along with their teachers. I also attended our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting and we have begun the planning process of our first annual Innovator of the Year award ceremony which we're all very excited about. Um, and lastly, one of our schools was also nominated for the Cesar Chavez Community Leadership Awards. I encourage everyone to attend the award ceremony. Um, it will be held on Thursday, March 28, 2019 at 6 p.m. at the City of Watsonville Community Room 275 Main Street on fourth floor. And lastly, um, on Tuesday, February 26, Senate Bill 126, um, a charter school transparency bill was passed by the Assembly Education Committee with a 5-1 vote, and it's on its way to the desk of our Governor Gavin Newsom, who has publicly declared his intent to sign the charter um, school transparency legislation, which I think is great for public ed in general. I think we, we do need a lot more transparency. When it, come, when it comes to independent charter schools. Thank you, Karen.
Good evening. So I was able to attend the 16th annual egg drop contest in celebration of Engineers Week at Watsonville uh, Public Library. And it was, uh, it was a blast just to see, you know, literally in some cases, <laughs> um, but to see community members come together and, you know, take a fun approach to demonstrating their engineering skills. And it, it was just, I, I had a great time. Um, I also attended the PVUSD Parent Conference, and this is a tremendous opportunity for parents. Uh, the three workshops that I attended were Chatting in Rainbows that went over how to support our LGBTQIA plus youth. One on positive discipline, which, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm a parent of three kids, and so I, I'm still learning. So getting to learn something about positive discipline was, so that's, that's some nice uh, effects in my household. Um, and then another on communicating with difficult topics with your, uh, with your child. And I really hope that our, our PVSD parents will keep space open in their calendars for next year's conference. Um, I also, along with uh, Trustee Dodge, met with Rich Puente, the director of our Healthy Start program, and uh, representatives from Salud para la Gente. And they were very generous in meeting with us and, and showing us the, the Children's Resource Center and speak about the services they provide to uh, underserved kids in our community. That's it. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, this weekend, I got to also attend our parent conferences, which was wonderful. Um, Gustavo gave a wonderful talk about bullying and the effects of bullying and how to do um, prevention with our children and in our schools. And love that we're moving forward with that. And some points were brought up by parents that the superintendent took notes on. And so we will be moving forward with some suggestions from students and parents also. Um, I was also able to meet with our mayor and we talked about some safety issues with crosswalks in the community, um, especially with the new housing development that is happening in Watsonville over by the, the SLU with Blackbird Homes and over on Loma Prieta. So he is going to be pushing for uh, safe crosswalks over there. There's also another um, crossing area off of Ohlone, um that is going to be looked at to make sure that our children going to Landmark and Radcliffe are safe when they're, they're crossing for schools. Um, so I thought that was you know, a, a very important. Um, also was at WCSA, which is our charter school here, and got to see their invention convention. And it was wonderful to see the students' creativity, lots of great inventions. One of my favorites was the homeless coat that was um, submitted by a student. It was a jacket that was designed to help homeless people stay warm. And then another favorite was there was a young woman who did um, eggs out of paper mache, so biodegradable Easter eggs, and she l layered them with flower seeds, so once you're done getting all your goodies out, you can plant them and have flowers. So there were some great ideas. Watsonville Charter School of the Arts, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, uh, good evening and welcome to all. I, I just want to take a moment and thank you, President Trustee Osmondson, for acknowledging our districts and our communities lost with Todd. And I'd just like to reiterate that our thoughts and our hearts go out to his family and our extended family at McQuitty School. Um, on another note, um, I would like to mention for our high school senior students in our community that the Watsonville Santa Cruz JACL scholarships are currently open for high school senior students looking to go on to college who are looking to specialize in law or the creative performing arts. There is also a scholarship for those um, who are in need of financial aid in this time of rising tuition costs. Um, this year there is also a new scholarship which will be awarded to a graduating high school senior in our community to attend college in Japan to study for a bachelor's degree in international studies for four years. I highly encourage any students in our community looking to specialize in one of these fields or majors to look into applying for one of these scholarships. Information on these scholarships can be found on the Watsonville Santa Cruz JACL website. I would also like to take the moment to remind our students that the early deadline for filing your FAFSA is this Saturday, March 2nd for your most eligibility on awards for attending college next year. 
Um, I'd also like to take a moment to also mention that the United Way of Santa Cruz County and United Way of Monterey County offer free income tax preparation and filing for people and families, parents, and students in our community who earned $55,000 or less in 2018. In reviewing last census data for our community, I realized there are several people, uh, families, and even working students in our community who are eligible for this program. Having been and being a certified income tax preparer through this program and through the IRS, I can personally attest to the high quality and professionalism of the income tax pre preparers through this program. Again, this program provides free income tax preparation and filing to all people, families, and students in our community who earned $55,000 or less in 2018, and it provides a reliable place to receive income tax pre preparation and filing helping those in our community who need it. This program will prepare and file your income taxes, whether you are a W-2 wage earner, 1099, or a self-employed individual. So please go to either United Way Santa Cruz County or United Way Monterey County's websites, depending upon which county you reside in, to find information regarding this great program. Thank you. Hi there. Um, like Maria, I attended the Pajaro Valley um, Educational Foundation meeting. It was, it's very exciting to try to build a nonprofit that's dedicated to the kids in this um, district, and we hope to be able to provide um, incentives, innovation, and support for um, for helping kids achieve higher than they are now. Um, I also attended a PBPSA meeting this month. It was excellent. Um, it is starting to be the spring um, a sports season, and um, any given night you could find you you could find me on um, the basketball court watching. Um, Aptos girls won the CCS um, game in um, over the hill, and the boys lost, so that was sort of bittersweet. Um, tomorrow, the boys play in their last NorCal champ championship game. Um, and then my daughter runs track, and um, any Saturday morning and Thursday afternoon, you will find me out at the track. I want to um, bring special attention to the coaches and the athletic directors in this county that um, provide so much um, inspiration, mentoring, and care to our kids. I think for a lot of kids, they wouldn't be in school unless they had access to sports. So I just want to say special nod out, a shout out to our coaches. Um, and I see Brad Hubbard in the back of the room. Brad, can you come up here for a minute to the podium? <laughs> <clears throat> this is completely impromptu, but you can stand at the podium if you want. I don't know why you're here, Brad, but I was at the Pajaro Valley Chamber Dinner, and you were honored this year as Man of the Year. Thank you. Yeah. And um, El Elaine, do you mind coming up for a minute? So my understanding was you were the you were or you are the athletic director at Watsonville. I was. You I are. Was. You're retired now, right? Yes. So, for the many many years of service to the kids at Watsonville High and to your colleagues in general, congratulations and thank, thank you. you very very much for your, for making kids' lives better. Uh, and so I don't you. know if yeah. So Elaine, I wasn't sure if you have just a couple this of comments. Is, this is oh. the lady who cuts my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously he hasn't allowed me to do for a while. Um, I'm not sure if I can, it, I would have to think about it and not become emotional. Um, Brad is a gift to our community. He wasn't born, he was born in New York, moved to LA, still an LA athletics fan, that's his problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, but he's really dedicated his life to not just Watsonville High School, but our whole community. And I feel very strongly that um, he was given that award because of what he does for the whole community. And if you talk to any youth sports organization, they use Watsonville High School because they know they've got a friend in Brad to help make it work. Because frankly, our staff couldn't handle all the requests we have. Um, so much more than just that, Coralitas Padres and Red Cross. I mean, the list goes on and on. And sadly, I don't think the Man of the Year tribute um, highlighted all of them. So I wish you had let me know I would have brought the whole list. 
I, I didn't you, know Kim. he was going to be here. I recognize that. Hair, I'm sure he's haircut. here to honor somebody else yeah. that we love very much, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's all. I hijacked okay. the meeting. Sorry. Thank, Thank you, you, Brad. Thank I, you for everything. I, I'm here to, to support Bill Sunderland. But I wanted to say, uh, you know, uh, this year, this week we lost uh, somebody at Watsonville High School, uh, Peggy Ernst, who, uh, you said that, um, can I? Uh, Peggy Ernst uh, was, like so many people, working in the background, making, she made me a much better athletic director because she was the fiscal person, she was the foundation president, treasurer, on and on and on. And, and um, I just wanted just to acknowledge her and, and her efforts on supportive kids throughout the community, if I may. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to finish things off, i just like to thank everybody for being here. Uh, a couple of events that I've attended, I've been attending a lot of Watsonville boys soccer. Um, they tend to go under the radar lots of times, but it's always a great program. Thank you, Coach Roland. Uh, you know, he's taken a lot of our teams to the CCS. I've been attending with the mayor, Mr. Baco, even though he's an Aptos Mariner, but he's here supporting Watsonville High Athletics. I also got to attend um, Watsonville High's uh, Ponds for Talents with Pete Galvan. He's been doing it a long time. I'd like to say thank you, Pete. Um, he's My pleasure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Pete, for all the years and all the kids that you helped. I've also, also attended with you know a lot of these trustees, um, Ruby Vasquez's event that was held at the Mellow Center. Um, and I also got to attend Nancy Bilicic. Uh, she must have locked out. Um, she had a report on adult ed, and there was a lot of community members, a lot of good things out of adult ed, so I just want to say thank you, Nancy. Okay. Uh, I feel so horrible because I've been going to the parent conferences for like 14 years, and I didn't go this time. <laughs> Terrible. But um, <laughs> um, so I also went to DLAC as well, and actually Dr. Rodriguez was there to discuss the Youth Truth Survey, but it is on our agenda. So if you want to wait for that, it's on our agenda. And here's what I wanted to say about the map discussion we had there and what Maria had to say about it too. But um, I totally love that students that did know exactly how they did each time on the map um, felt completely empowered and totally motivated to know all the things that they did well and feel proud of themselves for all the things that they did well. And they were really willing to work on what they needed to improve in. Um, there was some, a couple students that actually, you know, wrote about it. They said, oh, <laughs> I was so glad to know that I did, that I do really, really well in fiction, but that I need to do a little bit better in nonfiction. And, and they said, well, I'm going to, and they actually said exactly what they're going to do to work on their nonfiction skills in their little report. And there was another one that was there too. <laughs> that was like so cool. So I, I'm, I, I think, you know, it's so critical that every single student gets to know exactly how they're doing because the MAP tests are three times a year. So each time they can know how they've done and how they've improved each time that they have done the test and feel empowered and motivated to continue. So, And it's also really important for um, parents to actually know exactly how their students are doing on the MAPs. All the parents should know exactly what their students are doing on the MAPs too. Um, so I also went, a lot of places with Danny. <laughs> I also went to the Adult Education Community Advisory Council. And it's a wonderful place because there's probably at least 40, 40 um, people there from all these different organizations from all over the community. It's incredible how many different organizations are there for um, the Adult Education Advisory Council. Council. And, and this is, this is what I learned there, too. I'll just really quickly, I know people are taking such a long time talking today. Um, I learned that, the, that they have the IET, which um, is a base skills, which they can learn about their base skills 
in reading and math and become more proficient in reading and math. And then there's this other program that was really interesting to me is, is that when they teach ESL, they also teach career skills together with ESL, so which means that they totally have to collaborate with um, the career uh, people, career and technical education, I guess you can call them, people, and with the ESL, English as a Second Language people. And they said that they often have two teachers in the classroom, um, one that is teaching ESL and the other one that's helping them with vocabulary and skills needed for their career and also things about their career. So two teachers is obviously expensive to have two teachers in a classroom. So adult education would love to have the funds to be able to do much more of that, to have much, many t you know, much more of two teachers in the classroom. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so I was also at the, with the, at the Mata um, talent show, and I'm going to say what Mata means, it's, and it's at Watsonville High School. It means Mexican-American, Mexican-Americans taking action, which is pretty cool. Mexican-Americans taking action is pretty cool. So <laughs> by Pete Galvan. And, um, and you're also here, too. And I was also went to the Cesar Chavez Democratic Club. <laughs> and you were there too. <laughs> and Danny was there too. A lot of things, we go together. And Dr. Rodriguez was there at our meeting. And she talked about um, LCAP, but she talked about our issue with um, the charter school that came that we voted against. And so did the County Office of Education voted against them as well. And what happened when we went to the state level and blah, blah, blah. And quite a few issues about what's going on with that. And our Cesar Chavez Democratic Club really wants to support this whole issue and, and put together and do their own resolution on sort of our behalf about it as well. So that was pretty cool. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Not, I forgot to turn it off. I turned it off again. So we're going to have three high schools here to give reports. Watsonville High School, New School, and Pajaro Valley High School. So our first one is Watsonville High School. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Chavez, and I come to represent Watsonville High School. Um, so first off, for our athletics, our soccer team is playing NorCal Championship sem Semifinals this February 28th, which is tomorrow. They will be playing at Richmond High School in Richmond at 6 p.m. Um, and then also on February, I mean, it's going to be the 48th Annual Wildcat Relay this Saturday, March 9th. Um, it's just um, a bunch of like c like competitions and like different different activities, um, physical, Correct. yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Next is um, kinder, more empathetic you. Uh, one way that our school tries to be kind and empathetic is National Syndrome National Down Syndrome Day um, on March twenty first. During lunch, there will be free food and DJ and fun activities to celebrate and appreciate those with Down syndrome, as well as National Autism Awareness Week, which will be from April 8th to April 12th. We will have a Spirit Day, Spirit Week, sorry, and there will be dress out days. Next um, up is teacher pay. There are two students by the name of Larissa Yassin and Anaí Martinez who revolved their CAP project around the idea of advocating for a higher teacher's pay. They believe that teachers getting um, a better pay, well, students will obtain quality 
education and more teachers will be willing to stick around for a longer period of time, considering that over these past few years, some of our most admired teachers have left because of the amounts that they earn. Um, okay. And then, <coughs> um, next is LPAC testing, and their, um, which stands for English Language Proficiency Assessments for California. Um, it took place this week on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and it went very well. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Good evening, uh, my name is Christopher Lopez. Uh, today I will be representing New School Community Day School. So let's proceed to the slideshow. Uh, at the foundation of our third quarter, we received New School uh, sweaters, which, um, which on the back it said respect, temperance, um, excuse me. Um, integrity, personal growth, education, family, and service. Uh, at the end of outdoor science and character development, uh, we wrote thank you letters to Mr. Cruz. Um, we had a barbecue and they asked us what we learned during that day. Um, at the end of the year, we had the celebration where we went to Growing Up Wild, where we had activities, and we had our circle of respect, which is represented in the image. We also did a thank you cards to Growing Up Wild, PV High Food Services, Watsonville Rotary, and Science Workshop. Uh, here are some um, examples of the thank you letters to these places. Uh, during the holidays um, in the month of December, we decided to have a Christmas party where um, tacos, where tacos and dessert was present and we, um, we also saw Christmas movies. It was also ugly sweater day that day and we did white elephants. Uh, here are two images. The one on the left is with my principal Ramirez and Mr. Love, our science teacher. And with them are students, and it was pajama day during this time. On the one on the right is uh, Mr. Ramirez, my principal, receiving uh, a gift which had um, G-straps. And <laughs> the one on the right is our teacher, uh, our math teacher. She received an old used deodorant. Um, uh, kids had the opportunity to go to science camp during the month of November. This is where they had opportunities to receive 60 community hours, and they were there for three nights and four days. They did a night hiking. Uh, they also had campfires, and at the end of the camp, they had performances. Uh, for our senior plans, uh, we're having a prom after a w um, such a long time. And our theme is Arabian. Um, we decided that we're going to have a senior trip as well. We're planning on going to Great America. Um, and uh, for the yearbook, we're planning of having one page for every student in the school, which is really creative because they can do as they please on that page. Um, we're also having senior portraits during the month of July and May. Um, we are almost done with gardening. We have already done weeding. Um, we have done planting and replanting. Uh, we have painted the beds and boxes. 
we are currently building a greenhouse uh, from reusable water bottles, and we have, yeah, and we have um, also built plant boxes. Uh, we recently had our 21st, 25th year anniversary of New School. Um, at Taquero was present there. Uh, we actually had some fundraising uh, cells, which uh, consisted of sweaters and t-shirts. Um, um, so, uh, uh, um, so our current program is uh, Ocean Science. And next week, we're going to Año Nuevo to go, uh, go on a hike for around, I believe, two hours. And we're seeing, uh, ele yes, elephants, yes. Elephant. Yeah. Uh, we are currently in our basketball season. season. Um, practice is from Monday through Thursday. And on Fridays, it's game days. Uh, we already passed volleyball season, but I just wanted to present it here. Um, so Mr. Love, our science teacher, he made a bet on the students. If uh, New School was victorious, they were able to shave his head. And since we were victorious, that's, that's what we did. <laughs> yeah. And lastly, uh, we have our counselor, Ms. Michelle, which helps us with signing up for Cabrillo College. Uh, she, help, she also helps us with FAFSA and she helps us uh, communicate with um, college counselors. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jaylene Solorzano and I am the ASB president at Pajaro Valley. With me is Kayla Salazar, the ASB treasurer, and Ashley Castillo, the ASB secretary. Um, for our girls and boys varsity basketball teams, we are extremely proud to announce that they made school history this year. Our girls team finished undefeated and won league champs. And our boys team made it. <laughs> and our boys team made it to CCS quarterfinals for the first time in school history. For the first time, two of our own athletes, Christian Quintero and Jaylene Solorzano, received League Most Valuable Player for Basketball. Spring sports have begun and our volleyball boys took on Watsonville High last night. They were able to win behind Zanar Ocampo, 46 assists, and Marcos, 20 kills. This past Friday, we had our annual Noche de Banda dance. We had a DJ for two hours and a banda for two hours as well. It was a huge success with over 250 students attending. In March, we are planning to have our class competition rally. This week will consist this week will consist of spread days and activities throughout lunch. Since our theme is based on American Ninja Warrior and Wipeout, our event our event and games will c correlate with the sh the shows. Thank you. Thank you. I'm bad about turning my mic on. <laughs> so now we're gonna have student recognition and we only have one student tonight from Mar Vista, Gavin Aminifard. <laughs> family needs to come up too if there's okay. any family. Yes. Get, bring the family, get up here, all the family. Up, everybody. <laughs> Is that you? What? Oh, you, Jen. 
Good evening, President Osmondson and Dr. Rodriguez and esteemed Board of Trustees. Thank you so much. I'm Stephanie Monroe. I'm the principal at Mar Vista Elementary, and I'm extremely excited to be here tonight to recognize our Mar Vista Elementary Student of the Year, Gavin Amenafard. There's a lot that I could say about him uh, in the time that I've known him as a sixth grader, but then also going back as a second grader, first grader, and kindergarten student, too. Um, but I would like to give that opportunity to his teacher, Mr. Daniel Jacobs Meyer. Thank you for having me, uh, President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez, and board. Uh, it is with great pr pride and pleasure that we announce Gavin Aminifard as Mar Vista School's Student of the Year. Gavin embodies Mar's, Mar Vista values in every respect. He is always kind, caring, compassionate, respectful, and he always goes out of his way to help others. He works tirelessly in everything that he does and always strives to do his best. One of the things that I love most about Gavin is that when he's faced with a challenge, he never gives up and he always perseveres through hardship. He will not let me move on from a topic until he's 100% sure that he understands it, and I love that. Um, and this hard work and determination, along with support from our amazing resource staff and teachers and the great advocacy and support from his parents, has enabled him to make some enormous progress over the last few years. This has resulted in him no longer qualifying for special education services as a student with a learning disability, and that's a huge, huge, huge amount of progress on his part. It's a really incredible achievement, and, a true, and it truly speaks to his determination. In addition to this great perseverance with his academics, he has a unique ability to brighten up every room he walks in with his smile and his great sense of humor. These are traits which make others feel welcome and at ease and help make him a appreciated by everyone around him. He is truly a well-rounded person, be it sports, academics, helping others, leadership, and an overall desire to better himself every day. These traits will no doubt enable him to do great things in his life. Gavin is an exemplary role model in and out of the classroom and always leads by example. Congratulations, bud. I represent part of um, the Mar Vista area, and my son went to Mar Vista, and we love your school. It's one of the best. Congratulations on the job well done, and we look forward to hearing more about your success in the future. Thank you. Hearing about your kindness and determination is really inspiring. It's you know that has the potential of not only changing the world around you, but changing the world itself. So thank you for being here. Thank you. You know, I just want to say to the um, student representatives, if you need to go do homework or do other things, you can leave if you want. Uh, they are go They're leaving. They are leaving. <laughs> Okay, let's move on. Approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? Move approval. And second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 7 0. 
six. One. Oh, six. There, oh, so, oh, there's one that's not here with us right now. Six zero. Six zero. Sorry about that. One. Six zero one. Six zero one. How about approval of February twelfth board meeting minutes? Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? And it's 601. I learned how to do this. <laughs> okay. Um, now we're, this is just public comment. So if, so Danny, so if we can have some public comment and Danny can call out those who are going to come up to comment. So the first person we have is Jessica Garasco. Hi everybody, um, my name is Jessica Carrasco um, and I'm here to just talk about a scholarship that I created. Um, I sketched out a Watson the logo and I printed out 300 stickers. Um, I sold them all um, and I was able to fundraise um, a scholarship for students here in Watsonville. Um, a little bit about the scholarship, um, the student has to be a senior in high school. Um, they have to be a senior in high school, um, planning on going to college, community college, uh, private or technical school in the fall. Um, there's no GPA requirement, there's no social security requirement, um, and they have to live in Watsonville or the surrounding areas. Um, so the reason I'm here is pretty much to let you all know about the scholarship and if you can help me uh, spread the word or connect me to counselors that work with senior high school students that are in our district. Um, and that also includes the charter schools or the um, continuous high schools. Um, and I have some flyers here that I can pass out with my information. And I'll put some flyers in the back. I didn't bring a lot. So if you guys want to take a picture of, of the flyer, that way you guys have my information. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm, you said your name was Jessica yeah. Perez? Carrasco. Carrasco. Thank you, Jessica, for that. That's wonderful. N next up, we have Bill Beecher. Good evening, uh, Board President uh, Dr. Rodriguez and uh, trustees. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight is uh, we've gone 11 years without a recession. And uh, in my uh, career, we used to have a recession every four years. An electronic industry had to get used to that. We had to plan for it. And uh, before 2008, we had a recession in 2002. So they happen fairly often. We've gone through an un unbelievable period. And I think and a lot of financial people are saying there's another one coming. And so I wanted to take you back to 2008 and the only uh, board member that was present then was Karen, and she knows uh, how difficult that was. It was horrible. So uh, I'm a firm believer in uh, doing reviews, and you look at what went well, what did uh, go well, what did you learn, what do you do different the next time. So I'm going to take a look at the 2008 budget process, share with you some of that stuff that we learned and hopefully you can use that, and I believe you're going to need it for your upcoming uh, negotiation. So first of all, it was very painful. It was very difficult. The yelling and shouting that went on here was unbelievable. But that process, even though they were successful in cutting the budget, it left some significant damage. <clears throat> Wonderful. Wonderful. So there's an overriding fact that the number of teachers in the classroom is fixed by the California Department of Education. And that was one of the things we ran into in 2008. So consequently, when you have a recession, we cannot cut many teachers. And in our case in 2008, we cut 3%, mainly through attrition and early retirement. However, the other fact was that we had to cut 28% of our classified staff. Management cuts, that included the elementary assistant principals, all gone. Arts and music, decimated. Athletics, decimated. Operating budget deficit, uh, was, didn't leave us with much. But we also 
and I forgot to put it on the slide, is we cut a lot of nurses and counselors, the very thing that we've had to try to put back into the budget. So what I'm going to do is suggest some alternatives that we could have done at the time, but you couldn't because of the union contracts. So what I'm proposing is two different alternatives, two different approaches, which I think you're going to need to think about as we go forward in the next couple of months. The union contract should include a contingency clause that if revenues drop, which is what happens in a recession, then the wages drop accordingly. Now, conversely, if the revenues go up, wages should go up correspondingly. And this is a very common practice in other districts, but not here. Now, a second approach, which we use at Hewlett Packard, is that you do it by types of jobs. And so the last recession I went through at HP, Management took a 15% cut, and the idea was you lead by example. So management takes the biggest hit. And in our case, teachers and professional classified would take a 10% cut, and non-professional classified would take a 5% cut, because this is kind of geared towards what the people can afford. Those that can afford to have their wages cut the most take the biggest cut. Now, those are just representative numbers. You adjust that based on how much you have to actually cut. So um, I'm suggesting you need to act responsibly and adopt one or the other or even a third alternative as you work through the sun, uh, sunrise clauses and the contracts that you're going to be negotiating uh, this spring. Uh, because if you don't, what happens especially with PVFT, is if you lock into a contract that doesn't have a contingency put into it, when the next recession cuts, you can't cut any teachers. You can't cut their wages. You're going to have to decimate your classified again. We haven't even replaced the classified that we cut the last time. Now, if we have to cut classified one more time, throw, throw CSEA under the bus, God help us because we've had trouble keeping the, the schools running and keeping our bathrooms clean. And you've, Well, most of you ha haven't heard the stories that our high school kids have come in when they've done the reports talking about how bad the bathrooms were. And to the superintendent's credit is they worked hard to try to clean those up. So it's your choice. You can choose to do what we've always done, which is not to have a contingency clause built into these contracts. Mm -hmm or you put a contingency in. I've given you two types. There, there are other approaches. Now, I want to switch the pitch to a whole different deal. Last night, the Aptos Mariner. Oh, Mr. Beecher, that was five minutes. OK, so. this is quick. The Aptos Mariner basketball team had to go to Piedmont last night in their individual cars. Now, they're going to regional championships, and this district can't afford to get a bus to send them. That's wrong, and it's wrong for all the other teams that made it into the championships. I mean, when I played sports, and I don't know about yourself, Daniel, we went by bus, and so you developed a tremendous team com camaraderie. Think about that. Thank you. Next, we have David Turum, your senior. Because I know there's a junior out there. Good evening. Um, I'm here to. Wait, wait. This is. Um, I'm sorry. This is for item 8.1. Yes, it is. Sorry. Perfect. <laughs> sorry. You'll come back. I just saw the name and I was happy about that. We've called more than one. Yeah. Just to get ready. Next, last one for 6.1 is Ramiro Medrano. Good evening. Good to see. <laughs> Familiar faces. Uh, my name is Ramiro Medrano. I'm a, uh, a longtime resident, born and raised here in Watsonville, counselor currently at PV High. I've uh, been on and off with the district for about 15 years in different capacities, um, counselor for going on to four years. I, I'm here to uh, talk about a few, um, a few things. I'm going to try to speed it up because I know I, I have three minutes. Um, 
So a few praises and a couple of concerns um, that I want to bring forth. First of all, I want to thank uh, whoever was instrumental in bringing Landed to the community because that actually helped me out and my family to purchase our first home. Um, and yeah, thank you. And uh, which is a big deal. Unfortunately, it had to be in Salinas because even you know, uh, with that help, um, you know, it wasn't enough to get a home here in Watsonville, which kind of broke my heart, but my plan is to come back. But thank you for that. Uh, the other thing, uh, I bring uh, some flyers for a speech and debate showcase that we will have at the Mellow Center on March 8th. Um, thank you to the migrant program, Luz Medina, you know, for uh, investing in speech and debate teams for migrant students in the, in the district. Uh, I think it's essential to develop their, their uh, language skills, especially like English language learners in both English and Spanish, and their confidence you know, in sp public speaking and critical thinking and, and uh, debating and, and you know, performing. So uh, I'm gonna pass around um, at the end some flyers for that. And you are all invited March 8th uh, to the showcase at the Mellow Center at 6 p.m. So, um, and um, I wanna bring two, two concerns that I have the first one, uh, really quick, um, I, th I believe it was either last semester or last school year that I was shared with me that a very well-known author was gonna come to our community, our district, by the name of Jimmy Santiago Baca. Um, and I was excited. Uh, he is a well-renowned author, um, uh, actor, producer of movies, director, and, um, and then I learned that he was uninvited. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. Um, I, I think it was some of the content in his books um, that got him uninvited. Um, you know, and, and, and I think this is the exact kind of author that our community and our students need to be reading. Um, he brings forth a lot of issues from gangs to he was a foster child to violence, um, you know, uh, sexual stuff that, yeah, might be, might be a little, you know, uncomfortable for some of us, but nothing that our secondary students cannot, or have not, you know, heard of. Um, so I think I think uh, 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 it's important to rethink and reconsider um, the invitation uh, to Mr. Jimmy Santiago Baca. I would love him to come to our community and and um, speak to our students. I think it's essential. The last thing I want to forward, and I know my time's up, I'm gonna hurry up. Um, I want to bring forth the issue of the drug dogs in our uh, district. Um, it, you know, there's a, a, we pay for a program, a private company to come into our secondary schools with dogs to sniff for drugs and weapons. Um, and and I wanna uh, raise concerns about that as a counselor. Uh, I've seen firsthand uh, in some of the schools that I've worked at how some of these dogs alert on some of our students and a lot of the times they find nothing on the students. Um, maybe they smell, you know, their older brother or older sister's, you know, smoke, you know, from the day before, or the evening before Maybe their parents smoke because now it's legal in California to smoke marijuana if you're an adult. And some of these dogs are alerting on students and it's embarrassing for them to be pulled out of class, searched, their bags searched, you know, their, their compañeros know that they've been pulled out and then they find nothing. And this happened time and time again that I've, that I've experienced. So, uh, what I would like to know is, what, what is the success rate of our program? Uh, has it really brought down drug and violent instances in our secondary schools? And if not, why don't we invest that money in prevention? Thank, um, thank you, Mr. So Romero. I want to thank, thank you guys. And, and I'll pass uh, um, ACLU uh, um, 
article that talks about this in Washington State and also the flyers for migrant uh, speech and debate. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Mato. Now we have a employee organization, Pato Valley Federation of Teachers, Francisco. Uh, thank you, Francisco Rodriguez um, with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, just wanted to um, uh, make a couple comments on um, uh, some of the, the uh, uh, on prior comments. Uh, number one, uh, uh, we are in support of um, having uh, um, starting uh, our negotiations as soon as possible. As you recall, we started negotiations um, at the last school board meeting, but I do want to um, just make a couple clarifications. There was a comment reg regards to uh, yelling and screaming that was done. Um, if there was any yelling and screaming, that was due to the lack of clear communication with the bargaining units. I believe that uh, in this new round, that has uh, changed. Um, uh, there's, there's um, I believe, a more willingness to have the bargaining units at the table uh, discussing and trying to come to an agreement as to uh, what is available uh, for uh, not just uh, salary uh, increases, but to actually uh, invest money in improving our scores. So uh, I'm hopeful that um, that can uh, we can start our negotiations soon. Um, we were we were hoping to have uh, a a district sunshine this uh, meeting, but hopefully at the next meeting um, we'll hear um, what what the um, a district intends to uh, bring to the bargaining table. Um, the other. Um, a clarification I wanted to make is that um, our, our unit, as uh, most bargaining units, um, if not all, um, do not make proposals um, just out of the air. Uh, we, we look at uh, not just the needs of our members, but also the needs of the uh, students that we work with, the needs of the district as a whole, and we base our proposals on that. Um, not on random formulas about how much of a percentage cut or increase one group or another should get. Um, that is not the way we operate. We operate by looking at the needs of the district. If the district has a need for um, reduce, uh, to reduce spending, then we want to know uh, how much is the need and uh, what areas can be uh, reduced without any impact on student learning or the livelihoods of our members. If, um, as it appears this year, there are uh, funds that can be invested uh, in employees and improving the delivery of service to students, uh, we also want to know how much and what would be the best way uh, to do that. So. Um, just wanted to, to clarify that and also just um, wanted to, uh, again, make the point that um, over the last uh, year and a half, um, there appears to be a lot more progress in negotiations, even though uh, they haven't started yet. So thank you. CSEA, California School Employees Association, it's saying the whole thing. <laughs> No. Okay, Pavam, which is the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. No Pavam people. And the last one is Communication Workers of America, CWA. Okay, we're gonna st we're gonna start with action items, and we're doing eight point one, which is one which our friend was here for. There he. <laughs> to approve the naming of the auto shop after Bill Sunderland, Elaine Ligaretta, principal. 
Watsonville Good High evening. School. <laughs> My name is Elaine Legaretta. I'm the principal of Watsonville High School. Thank you, President Osmondson, Superintendent uh, Rodriguez, <laughs> and trustees. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Bill Sunderland, um, but I, I want to echo up front that this is a widely supported measure, and I appreciate your support on this. Bill Sunderland started his teaching career at Watsonville High School in 1970 and retired in 2017 after 47 years. Wow. Bill was hired at a time when there was a need to rebuild the auto program. He built a strong program with five classes each day and touched th thousands of young people and their families in the community. I recall as a student at Watsonville High School, girls did not feel comfortable in general auto shop classes. So he developed a course that covered the basics in case of a breakdown. He wanted to keep us safe. Over time, that barrier went away, and Bill often commented to me on how much he appreciated the young women in his classes as he knew each one sincerely wanted to learn about engines. Bill's education pathway was unique. He studied general education at Humboldt State, uh, received his Associate of Arts in Auto Technology at Santa Rosa Junior College, and received his Bachelor of Arts in Industrial Science at Chico State. Wow. On a trip to visit his parents in Pacific Grove, Bill dropped in to visit Watsonville High School upon hearing of an opening for the auto program. He took the position and never looked back. Bill felt the program at Watsonville High had more potential than other programs he had visited due to the size of the shop and interest at the site. Over his 47 years, he trained a large percentage of our local auto mechanics serving as a reference point for employment and keeping his ear open all across the valley for job opportunities for his students, current and former. He is so respected throughout the Monterey Bay area that he was asked to teach shop classes at Hartnell and served on the planning committee for Hartnell's state-of-the-art program redesign and construction. Here are words from a few of his former students. From Jim, Jim Howes. Bill was my advisory teacher in the early 1970s, and I remember seeing him walking to work as I drove, to, drove by in the morning. Bill lived close to the school and always wore his shop coat as he walked to school. And he walks fast, let me tell you. It said a lot about Bill as a teacher and community member. After I graduated, I reconnected with Bill when I began teaching courses for the Regional Occupational Program. I worked much closer with Bill when I became the assistant director and was impressed with his attention to detail. Steve Dobler, Watsonville High School graduate and business owner. He's constantly asking about my family and former classmates. Evan Clark, a current Watsonville High School teacher. He was a great teacher, mentor, and friend. He worked well with students and had a real passion to teach engine repair. David Patino, current Pajaro Valley School District teacher. I think naming the shop is well deserved as Bill spent his life advocating for vocational career technical education. As for my thoughts on Mr. Sunderland, he's been a tireless advocate for career technical education his entire year, always reminding us that not everyone is going to college and that technical reading and writing is more rigorous than most college reading. If you're an avoider of assembly instructions, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> Math needs to be a second nature for an auto mechanic to achieve effective engine operation. After his retirement, Bill has mentored our new teacher in building the program, and we continue to enjoy the photos he takes for Watsonville High School at school events, just as he has done for over 30 years. It is important to recognize that Bill could have made much more money had he spent his work life repairing cars. Instead, he chose to share his love of mechanics with the young people, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> inspiring them to follow their passion and to make great impact on his community. I'm proud to request that the Barbell Unified School District dedicate the auto shop, the Bill Sunderland Auto Shop. Did if you're you? here to support Bill, could you please stand? Wow. Thank you so, so, so much, Elaine, for telling us all about him. Thank you so, so much. So do I have a motion? Oh, we have a comment. Okay. All right. 
I forgot about that. Yeah. Now, David Turin. Thank you. Um, my name is David Toriumi. Uh, I'm the owner of Toriumi's Auto Repair. Uh, I was lucky enough to have Bill my senior year in high school. Um, his classes were really hard to get into. Um, I went the first semester, I went in as a uh, beginner, beginning auto shop, and Bill worked really hard and got me into advanced auto shop by the end of my senior year. Um, when Jim Howes told me that they were thinking about naming the building after Bill, um, I was ecstatic. Um, if there's anybody that deserves their name on a building, uh, it is definitely Bill. Um, his integrity, um, when I first started my business back in 86, uh, Bill was one of the first people I got a hold of. And when I ran into situations, Bill was the first person I got a hold of. So. Um, after Elaine, there's not a whole lot more I can say, but uh, it would be a well-deserved um, opportunity for uh, the board to uh, put his name on the building. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kenny Nutt. Hi, I'm Kenny Knott. Um, Coach, he knew of me before I was even one of his students. Uh, my dad raced cars and was very successful. Um, I was always very mechanical, and uh, Coach looked out for me, uh, got me a job with a very big national contractor here in town, got me in the apprenticeship program. Uh, we've always kept touch, not as much as I should have because I was always pretty busy, but uh, uh, for him, for, for, for us to name a, a, a building after him, is there's nobody better. And uh, just, you know, if I never thanked you, Bill, thank you. Um, I went on to be a successful race car driver at one time myself and uh, equipment manager at the Air Wilson Quarry in Aromas, the big gray hole there. So uh, he could have made a lot of money off doing things because he's got a lot of talent and he chose to get a lot of people, a thousand people to, to the level that uh, we went to. So just thank you, Bill. Thank you. Don't forget, I always thought it was named after him anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Next we have Freddie Rocha. So uh, I too, I went to Waltham High School. Uh, I was uh, basically uh, three years I spent at uh, UTA, I mean, uh, with uh, Coach Sunderland. Um, basically, my, my last year, I became a kind of his assistant. I was helping him. He inspired me to basically continue on my, med my medication. And then I became, now I'm an assistant maintenance manager for Santa Cruz Metro. And many of you might not know, but the last couple of years I've been working with him. We've been trying to create a partnership with Santa Cruz Metro, which I'm still gonna continue to help out, but basically, he inspired me to help out the community. This is, so, I, again, I, I hope you approve that, you know, naming the shop for Coach Center. Of course we will. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Pretty amazing, <laughs> the amazing guy. Okay, now can I have a motion? <laughs> I'll move to approve the naming um, of the shop after Bill Southern, and I would hope that um, my colleagues would allow Trustee Dodge Jr. to be the one to second that motion. I'd like to second that motion, thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> obviously none opposed, obviously, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, well, is there any discussion? Uh, I'd like to say something. Okay, yeah, discussion. I'd like to say thank you, Mr. Sunderland. Um, we're close neighbors. Um, Wildcat 2000. Um, I've known you've dedicated 
30 to 40 years, you know, helping kids, um, helping generations work, you know, get their hands dirty. I know you and my predecessor, predecessor uh, have want to continue, you know, hands-on classes, and I will be asking you for guidance. You know, I see you at 7-Eleven walking around, and I hope to continue talks, because I, I think, you know, your dream and all these people here, it, you, you made it come true, so i like to continue talking. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I think you should come up. Would you like to come up for just a minute? Could you want to come up? Vote! Vote! <laughs> um, uh, I got the nickname for Coach because two young men from Mexico, uh, just here, very nice young men, uh, they just not pronounce my name, Sunderland, who is who's Scandinavian. So one day they had a big smile on their face. They came out of the field house and they said, can we call you coach? And I said, what? And then I realized in those days, every PE teacher coached. So they thought it was like professor or maestro. And so I said, sure, this is the best these guys are gonna do. And, and they're showing respect. A month later, the principal walks by and says, hi coach. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was talking to the state of California and, and about something about vocational education and the guy stopped and said, I know I know you. And I said, well, you know, go to meetings and stuff. And he goes on and about three times. And the third time he says, are you the one they call coach? And I said, yeah. So <laughs> the state of Sacramento knows who coach is. They don't, have a who, they don't know who Sunderland is. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's been a pleasure. Um, I kind of got a feeling you should do what you got talent for. Uh, I discovered in student teaching that I had a talent for it and I enjoyed it. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. I hated to quit, but I have three grandkids I have to spend time in Salt Lake with. Um, I just can't be tethered anymore. But uh, I, I don't think, I, I, I was only going to teach for two years and go make some money. Uh, I started at $7,400 when I signed on. Pleasanton tried to get me to break my contract twice because they wanted me. But um, I think I made the right choice. and. Uh, I don't look back on anything. It's been a great time. Thank you. It was a fun agenda item. Okay. Um, now we're going to have 8.3. Oh, 8.2. Um, memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and Vision to Learn, which I'm pretty excited about, too. Um, it's going to be mich presented by Michelle Rodriguez, Dr. <coughs> Rodriguez. All right. So thank you very much. So this item actually came forward um, at the request of Trustee Dodge, Jr. So um, he had requested that I look into f trying to figure out if we would be able to provide um, vision screening to all of our students within the school district. So we currently do it for teeth through the DNFACE program. And so through this um, memorandum of understanding with vision for learning, um, vision to learn, excuse me, we would be able to provide not only um, free screening for all of our students, but any of our students, and this is at um, Title I school, so it, it, there are two elementary schools that wouldn't, um, would be excluded at this time, but we are in conversations with Salupa La Gente to see if we can ensure at least the students that are underprivileged at those schools, if they would be able to have contact. But what would happen is our nurses are stepping up, so our district nurses would be willing to be the point person. They would be there the day that the buses are there. Um, the students would be able to get the screening. Any student that came back needing a referral would actually be referred out and receive free glasses. So there would at, at no time be any cost to any of our students or parents or us. 
um, and we feel that it is um, a really good process. We would be doing it at the beginning of the school year, so the reason why we're doing the MOU right now is so that we can make sure and set up the dates and times and get our allocated spots now for the beginning of next school year. Mm, that's great. Okay. Can I, can I have a motion? Okay. Um, are there any public speaking? Okay. Any discussion from the board? You want to discuss? I would just like to say thank you, Michelle, and thank you, everybody, who helped me put this together. Um, I think it's important that we help the children when we can, and that's why I'm here, and that's how I was elected, so thank you very much. So um, all kids today have access to um, pediatric care, <coughs> and so how will this impact the billing at the pediatric office? If somebody else is billing for these vision services, and then they go to a pediatrician, or go to you know go to one of the safety net clinics that, in their well child checks, they're also getting vision screens. So, yeah. So they through Vision to Learn, we are not providing any information um, to about our students. So salud. The question actually came up prior. So salud para la gente would still be able to do duplication duplicate duplicative um, services for the children. What this would allow is all children, whether they have health care or not, whether they're registered or not, um, would be able to receive the services. Um, but it actually wouldn't, um, it, it wouldn't mean that other services could not be provided to them. But they would all be screened for us um, so that we'd make sure that all children either have a pass fail. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I just, you know, my, my question had gotten answered about, you know, the, the duplication of services. And I just, I, I just want to acknowledge the, the work of this and what an opportunity mm -hmm. is for our students who might have need for this. And to acknowledge our, our district's nurses, you know, coming as a nurse myself, just being willing to interface and take this on. Yeah, I made a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> okay, 7 0. Okay, 8.3 Core SIPS contract. This yeah. is pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the third, um, the third contract that we're bringing forward. So as you may remember, um, the last year we did the first um, core contract, which included the first three pilot schools. So we had a combination. What happens within those schools is we have both um, support for principals, we have support for teachers, um, and job embedded training. That means that it actually happens within the classrooms with the students so that there's modeling um, that occurs. Um, this past year, we had a much larger contract um, and we, um, we added on six addi additional schools. So the first year, you may remember, we went from 72% of our first graders um, come, being now able to read decoded text um, to 92 at those at those school sites, um, and we went to nine schools this year. The goal is next year to encompass each and every school. Um, the only school, um, and you'll see it on the chart there, the only school that is not included, there are actually two schools that will just be using it as an intervention process, and that would be Rio del Mar and Valencia Elementary, and that is because um, of the scores of the students, it's just necessary to be um, intervention. You will also notice that this is a much reduced cost. So last year there was it was three hundred thousand. This year it is much reduced. The reason for that is we have built capacity within our own teams, and so the only thing that we're bringing forward is the teacher component. Now we're actually in house doing the principal component. Um, and so it has been reduced down to 126,000 versus a little over 300,000 last year. So we're trying to augment to all schools and also make sure that we're being sensitive to budget. Um, but this has been a very successful project. 
um, and we have seen extreme results um, with our students. And as we know, um, we need to get our students reading at kinder first and second grade. We cannot wait to determine if they're readers by third grade. And so I ask that you um, approve the contract. No, absolutely. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. <clears throat> Any public speakers? Okay. Any discussion from the board? Michelle, I just have one question, uh, since I'm familiar with this, but is there plans to go forward? I know you do principal in-house tra training, but with teacher in-house training eventually too? Yeah, so after this next year, we'll determine if we need them at all. They are aware that we're trying to build them out of a job. So um, it will likely be greatly reduced. This coming year, we're planning on doing um, teacher expertise within the schools so that when we get new teachers on, we have people who are already able to support. Um, so you can for sure ensure that the contract will be even lower the following year. We may not need one at all. So we're trying to build capacity. Jen. And I just wanted to acknowledge that I've had a number of, you know, parents in, in my area, you know, looking forward to the expansion of the, of the program. And I understand it's not the, the baseline for Rio, but I love that it's still going to be implemented as, as an intervention strategy. Any other comments from board members? Um, this is an evidence-based program that we had implemented prior to your coming here. What we found out shortly after you got here is that it wasn't implemented correctly. So I'm um, very pleased with the results that SIPS has provided and um, provided to our kids and their scores so far. And so I'll be supporting this contract. Thank you very much. Absolutely. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Seven zero. Okay, now eight board four. We're going to have a low performing student block grant, and I think it's for our middle schools. That is correct. In fact, I want to honor some of the folks that are here with us here tonight. Our middle school team, we have about eight out of the 12 that were able to make it tonight. I know it's difficult to get away from families, but it definitely shows the commitment level that our middle school teams have to, towards working through this process, too. A few things in regards to the low performing block grant. Uh, it was originally initiated as a state initiative, so that funding came through based on a couple of pieces. Those pieces were essentially low performing in English language arts as well as mathematics. Uh, as we referenced last time we met with the MAP results, our middle schools were definitely needing some of the additional attention in order to make sure that we had growth in these areas as well. Uh, they are the target of the funding that we are looking at for this grant. Uh, we're eligible to receive just a, a little bit above the $1.2 million mark. That plan, though, requires a few things to be put in place. Uh, the first piece is that we have to make sure that we put together a plan that is strategic enough with evidence-based protocols. Um, again, that goes back to that conversation you guys were just having in regards to things being evidence-based. So the state requires that through the grant as well. Uh, we also have to show what the metrics or the measurements are going to be of those projects. And in addition, it requires the board to approve us receiving those funds as well. So tonight, uh, graphic should be very familiar to all of us in the room, but it is uh, what we've designed as a district to make sure that we get through initiatives and really re reach towards that goal. So what are the structures, what, how, and why we get there? Um, all of the pieces that we're looking at this evening are anchored to this as well. So you'll see those noted. We've identified the target as being middle schools. Our middle school team has worked with us as well to look at what are the areas that we can focus on as a group and really have some deep professional learning around. Uh, those areas are student connection, literacy achievement to get that vertical alignment, and building capacity. What we've done is break, broken these down into three different areas. You'll notice up here that you are seeing the student connection, which refers to the climate and culture. Uh, some of the areas that we're looking at is with our PBIS piece, that implementation level that you guys are talking about and referring to is really launching things in a way that things are being done correctly uh, and well. Uh, that includes looking at our tier one. So there are rubricing pieces that go with our climate and culture initiatives that aren't being utilized as well as they could be. So that's an area of focus for us. In addition, Strengths Academy, which is another vertical alignment that you'll see to the high schools. So our high schools are currently using Naviance that looks at Strengths Finders. Uh, this is an, a middle school addition, so to speak, that will align well with our Gear Up grant and some other uh, folks that are coming on the table with us as well in partnerships. 
And then the last piece there that you'll see is the professional development. So really spending time to make sure that uh, it, it's not an option, but we are making sure that our folks are de developing and going to trainings that are appropriate to really build the work out. To the right-hand side, you'll see where those stars are. Those stars are connections to the work that we said that we were going to do uh, as a district as well. And then the measurements that you'll see, there's a state application process uh, for PBIS, so it will require us to put those forward as well. And the TFI is the rubriking piece that gets done twice a year as well. So that'll give you guys a, a parameter as to how well we're doing with those initiatives in, indeed um, moving forward. And then five stars of student data is a collection tool as well use, being used at two of our high schools currently. Uh, but it really looks at getting the, the data of who's showing up to what events and which students are we not reaching so we can be more particular about how we engage kids and offer them different connections. And the second piece of the recommended plan is literacy achievement. So this is in alignment with our elementary side. So really looking at what is the next step in our literacy achievement levels. Uh, and part of that is looking at the collaborative levels that we've had. So you guys have often asked that if there are positive practices happening on some of our middle schools, how do we get additional folks to the table to see those as well? So this actually is the effort to do that. And what it looks at is getting all of our sixth grade teachers together in English language arts to be able to have those conversations and really look at best practices uh, specific to long-term English learners. So what are the strategies that are working well? And looking and analyzing student work. So are we anchoring ourselves to what we should be seeing in classrooms? Um, and really building out what the pacing and embedded assessments are. So again, not additional assessment, but are we using the tools and the curriculum that's provided to its fidelity to really make sure that we're seeing those growth patterns? You'll see the measurements in that is the embedded curriculum assessments already, and then lear student learning data. So that's a, a position that we're already working in, and it aligns to another uh, section that you'll be looking at tonight with Youth True Survey in terms of what kind of feedback do we give? The last piece of this is really looking at building capacity. Uh, so we've referenced this before, uh, but in, in re relationship to the site instructional leadership, there, there are some pieces that as you learn and as you grow, you start to get better at. And part of that is looking at the number of initiatives and the number of system integration pieces that we have and making sure that we're doing that in a way that isn't overwhelming our teachers, but is also responsive to the fact that we want to connect those pieces because that's the deepest dive that we have with really having our students achieve. It also looks at key strategies for change. So those small win areas, do we have the right core team, all of those questions will be posed and that will be part of our process through data as well. Effective facilitation and cognitive coaching. So a, you know, we often talk about what are the strategies when we are trying to get students to move, but we don't necessarily talk about the strategies of how do we make that shift sometimes uh, you know, with teachers and how do we do that in a responsive way that's collaborative and empowering to our teachers as well. So they're a part of this process as well as you saw on the last slide in regards to that collaborative level and really having folks anchored to this work. I think I was pretty good on that. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I, I thought I heard too that there's going to be particular focus on, um, for example, Pottle Middle School and EA Hall in terms of where they're at in terms of their English language learners and all the for oh. sure so this is just in relationship to the low performing block grant there are still other measures so we have CSI funding in addition to some other initiatives that we've already started at both of those schools that will continue okay. so these are the joint pieces that you would see across all of our middles and that would include Aptos junior in this mix as well okay oh would it's much bigger mm -hmm. any other any other questions board com comments no, there's no comments Danny. Um, so this is great news <laughs> Um, I like the fact that we're working on school connectedness. I know from some of the visits that I've had in, in different middle schools, that's the thing that was lacking, I feel. Um, and I, I heard it from Ito and his team, um, the fact that you know we did away with the activities directors within uh, those middle schools. So I'm not sure if that's the case for all sites, uh, but it, it, it's, it's good to keep our students engaged and connected to their schools. I think that's the way we keep them in there, right? Um, so it's good that we're moving in that direction. I also like the fact that we're focusing on strengths, finding the strengths of students. I think oftentimes we tend to focus more on the weaknesses. You need to improve in this area. You're lacking in this area uh, without leaving much room to, to really delve into those strengths, the strengths that they do have. 
So I think that's um, a move in the right direction. Um, and obviously the best practice is learning from other uh, middle schools. What are they doing right? It's working. Why are we, what are we doing to ensure that we implement those across the middle schools uh, to ensure that we're effective? Um, and, and the fact that we're also taking into account the feedback that we're receiving not only from students but teachers um, and, and teacher involvement overall. So I'm really excited about this and, um, and it, it's, it's good funding uh, going uh, to, to an amazing cost. So thank you for the work that the team has done to make sure that we have this funding allocated. Yeah. When will we have our first set of results coming out from this block? Grant? So what we'll be doing is pushing forward, assuming that it all goes well this evening in the end of the discussion, we'll go ahead and make sure that we receive those fundings, but we've already started this work. So part of this, yes, it is contingent on funding, but a lot of these pieces can start to be set up now. Uh, during our last principals meeting, we had some of those conversations already about uh, assigning specific uh, positions or leadership pieces, as well as looking at our grade level spans and who will be sitting on some of those committees moving forward too. So some of that legwork in the front of it is done so that we're ready to, to hit the ground running as soon as that funding drops. And this is primarily going to two middle schools? No, so this is primarily going to five middle schools, but we've also made a commitment as a district that Sorry, Aptos Jr. Sorry, I know Jr. you said that. Yep. So but yeah, so that's what I wanna know, because that's five plus Aptos. So you know, we've gotten millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of grants that have we funneled directly into low performing schools with zero results. So I want to see some results. <laughs> we have <laughs> tons so of data points for us to be able to bring forward, so we'll know. No, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments, Jen? No? Oh, I, I look like you were going to make a comment. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to say I'm just so glad that, you know, I can see from the fact that they're even here, so many middle school principals that are here, that I'm just so glad that they really understand the importance of, for example, working together and being really collaborative in terms of putting out this program and in terms of data, in terms of connectedness, as Maria talked about, and all that kind of stuff. So it looks very positive going forward and so we have to take action to make sure your funds come in <laughs> all right uh, do i have a motion i'll make a motion to approve i'll second mm -hmm. and no speakers obviously all right um all those in favor aye aye, aye. all those opposed seven zero thank you We've got lots, lots of really great agenda items tonight, lots of really great ones. This one's a really good one, too. Um, this is 8.5, new classification description, school vehicle driver, and that's going to be presented by Chona Killeen. Uh, yes, thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this is uh, Transportation, Katie Powell, uh, Director, and work with CSAA and HR um, because this is a, a classification that will give our transportation uh, department more flexibility in transporting our students. I will defer the rest of the specifics uh, to Personnel Director um, Pam Shanks as this is an item that was also co-submitted to the Personnel Commission. Uh, good evening, President Osmondson, uh, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Rodriguez, and Cabinet. Um, I am bringing forward the following class description of school vehicle driver, which, um, as Chona mentioned, um, was worked on in collaboration with Human Resources, Transportation Administration, and CSEA. Uh, Transportation Administration is always looking at ways to save money and be more efficient in their department. So they brought to Human Resources a recommendation to create a position to help solve a challenge that they have been facing. Um, transportation has been utilizing outside companies to drive students with unique needs Taxi. or circumstances. Taxis, yeah. Partially, yes. Ta partially taxis. taxis. Yes, or th and these uh, um, outside companies um, also have other kinds of vehicles that they utilize as well um, to drive students um, for that are not able to ride on a school bus. Um, after conducting a cost analysis, um, the administration and transportation found that there would be a savings to the district 
by hiring our own employees to do this work instead of using the outside companies. Um, the goal is that over time, as we continue recouping costs by providing the service in-house, the program can expand with the purchase of additional vehicles and additional staff. Um, Transportation did have the opportunity to purchase um, two vehicles actually from adult education and um, Rich Ariana worked um, on brokering that deal, if you will, <laughs> between the two departments. So that was um, where this all got started. Um, the collaborat uh, collaborative work with Human Resources, Transportation Administration, and CSEA resulted in the attached class description brought to you for approval tonight. Um, as you rem remember from the last board meeting, there's a dual responsibility um, with creating new class descriptions with the Personnel Commission and the board. And um, the class description presented before you was approved by the Personnel Commission at their January 31st meeting. Um, the salary recommendation made by the Personnel Commission was at range 32 on the classified salary schedule. Um, after further conversation with CSEA, the district and CSEA um, did agree to place the position on range 33 of the classified salary schedule. Um, agreeing to this range placement does not disrupt the internal alignment of classifications set forth by the Personnel Commission, so that range placement can move forward. So I ask tonight that the board approve the attached class description of school vehicle driver with placement on range 33 of the classified salary schedule. Thank you. Can I have a motion? Second. Okay, no public speakers. Any discussion from the board? Do you want to say something? No? Oh, because you look like you're ready to go. Any, any discussion from the board? Nope. Okay, well, I'm, I'm very excited about this. It's going to happen. You know, Mich Dr. Rodriguez talked to me about it. I was like, whoa, it sounds so great to have our in house people being able to do something, which, you know, she explained to me that. I guess there's other vehicles, but that we have to actually have taxis to pick up our students, pay for taxis to pick up our students. Oof. Okay. <laughs> so I'm so glad about this. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7 0. <coughs> okay. The next one is. Um, 8.6, approved memorandum of understanding between Community Pro and Wattsville Aptos Santa Cruz to adult education. <laughs> Good evening, President Osmondson, <laughs> trustees, <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez and cabinet. Um, this is an opportunity, this is a good opportunity for you. Um, we are looking at an MOU with Community Pro, which is a division of uh, the parent company, is Literacy Pro. And it's a web-based case management platform to monitor transitions from our students to Cabrillo and other agencies. And then you say, well, wait a minute. You're going to share data? Yep, we can, because it's uh, covered by FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So we can share this data, and, and it's, you know, the best thing, it's going to be good for our students. We haven't been able to monitor their progress. So we're going to share our student data with Community Pro, as will Cabrillo share their data with Community Pro and other consortium partners to monitor where the students go between agencies and um, the different services they have in our region. So this is an MOU for just for your information and approval. Thank you. Any speakers? No. Um, can I have a motion? I'll move. A second. Any discussion from the board? This is great. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 7 0. Okay, so 8.7, second reading update. And um, this is a. <laughs> Michael Berman, <laughs> again. <laughs> Hi, Michael. <laughs> AR5125 student records. And this is a second reading. Yeah. So, uh, do you. <laughs> oh, what? The script? 
Well, these are second readings, and if and and you know, staff has ensured that any feedbacks provided by board members and received prior to the posting of the agenda has been incorporated. <laughs> okay, so can I have a motion? So moved. I second. Any public speakers? Any discussion? Any discussion with the board? Okay, you have a second. Uh, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed. <laughs> Okay, this is a second reading update guidance counseling service. Okay. I mean, I almost. Yeah, so I, I mean, I actually have some thumbs. I was going to, but I can talk to somebody about this later. But um, okay, can I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve this policy on guidance counseling services. I'll second. Yeah. Speakers. Okay, can I, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7 0. Second read update BP 1312.3 UCP. What is, I forget what that one is. UCP. <laughs> Uniform complaint process. Okay. You guys got what was it called? <laughs> Uniform complaint process. Oh, <laughs> that's it. Uniform <laughs> complaint. Okay, right. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 810, second reading update, AR 1312.4, Williams Uniform Complaint Procedure. Uh, do I have a motion? A motion. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 8.11, Professional Service Agreement, Fiscal Consultant Services. And this is a different one. See you soon. <laughs> and Michael Berman doesn't have to be up here. This is done by Joe Dominguez, CBO. Um, good evening, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Rodriguez. Uh, this evening we have a consultant contract um, a referral from School Services of California. As you know, we're in a transition as a district um, in our financial software for um, escape. Um, transitioning into that program uh, in partnership with the county and, and districts also within our county. That is going to be a uh, huge undertaking uh, with multiple trainings by departments um, and then also some protocols that we need to implement uh, internally and also look at our um, uh, other areas that we can be efficient, uh, what the system can accomplish uh, that our current system digital schools cannot. Um, so it has a lot of complexities uh, wrapped in within that. Uh, another component of the um, consultant agreement uh, through School Services of California is uh, we have our new Governor Newsom, uh, who's projected uh, preliminary uh, reports in January for a fiscal outlook. And now we've got recent news of some adjustments within the state economy, uh, not being as productive or revenues as predicted. And so there will be some necessary adjustments to our budgets, uh, to the May revise, um, and uh, the services provided uh, by the consultant, Ms., uh, Mrs. Irma Monso, will assist us in auditing, uh, verifying, uh, double checking our multi-year projections, our assumptions, uh, the necessary adjustments that we need to complete by uh, line item within our budget codes uh, throughout our system. And another component of that uh, huge undertaking that we're part of this transition is as um, the district entering into negotiations. So there's a lot of work that also has to be completed on various scenarios, given that financial data um, and assumptions. And so in preparation for uh, negotiations as well on a parallel track, uh, there is additional need for uh, support. Um, another component uh, of the contract uh, Whereas looking at a transition, not only for escape, but internal um, uh, timeline that we have for the various interim reports in our annual budget, but also a transition uh, for continuity within our fiscal services division. And so we currently have um, some management, uh, as we know, sometimes years of service and retirement uh, w this year, or next year, and some transition. So this role would also assist us in. Um, confirming our internal practices and just making sure that we have a process and transition plan to move forward. Um, so all that in summary 
is the role of this uh, agreement, uh, and I'm recommending for and asking for your support for approval. Can I have a motion? Second. Second. Any discussion from the board? I, I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. Is Ms. Manzo here today? No, she is not. She is, uh, the start date, uh, depending, uh, board approval is March 1st. Um, and the other uh, point that I forgot to mention is this is actually cost neutral for the district because what I'm using is the savings from the vacancies that we had for the um, risk and safety manager and also the payroll and benefits manager. So we had that line item within the budget. Um, because those positions were vacant, we're able to use those savings. Uh, I just ask because next time when consultants come, if they can show up because I like to see who they are. And we always hear the term consultants, but we don't see a face. And so I, I'd like to see that. Well, and, and where is this company? So located? School Services of California is a statewide uh, agency based in Sacramento. Uh, they are um, formal, uh, formal uh, CEO was uh, Ron Bennett, uh, now John Gray uh, is the president, and they assist districts, K-12 school districts and community colleges throughout the state of California in fiscal matters and fiscal advisory, uh, negotiations, um, multi-year projections, annual budgets, et cetera. If in the future if we could find consultants that are local around here, I think that'd be nice. I know how it goes. Thank you. You're welcome. Why exactly do you feel this consultant is necessary besides the implementation of new software? I think um, some of the other uh, components that we uh, need to, within our multi-year projections, is the support piece uh, in confirming, analyzing, and auditing our uh, adjustments and the various assumptions. Um, I believe with the multiple facets that I described, you have the new software implementation, which is a huge undertaking. We also have the May revise uh, that we know there's gonna be uh, adjustments made as well. And then also we have negotiations to so talk about multiple facets all at the same time. Um, that's, uh, there's a big need. And then also a long-term transition plan that I mentioned is making sure that we, um, verify all line items, we check, triple check our numbers, and just making sure how we can become more efficient and working on a transition plan for long term. Um, and that's um, kind of all uh, compiled into one. Aye. Aye. Thank you. So thank you very much. So it was referenced earlier um, in the night that in the 2017-18 school year, we did experience very challenging negotiations, as well as the expansion and revision of various job descriptions. So in September 2019, CSEA, PBFT, and PBUSD committed to beginning um, LMI, so Labor Management Initiative, in an effort to build more collaborative and also a positive working environment for all employees. And so current cabinet, um, specifically um, Dr. Colleen, is um, dedicated to moving this work forward with LMI um, with the ultimate impact on our students and families. And so you will note that in the contract, everything is identical except for just two areas. Her contract was originally when she first came into the district, which occurred on May 10th, 2017. The only two areas of difference is that her term has been um, extended and that her base salary was updated from what she was provided when everyone received the raise um, on May 23rd of 2018. So there is no salary increase other than what was given in May when everyone received their increase. 
And so I asked for the approval of the contract. I have a motion. I'll make a motion to approve Dr. Colleen's contract. I'll second. Any discussion from the board? Yeah, Georgia. Hi, Chona. Good evening. Um, I just need to, I want to uh, reiterate kind of the stance that I made at the last board meeting, not approving the other assistant soups contract and make sure that you understand I will be voting no on this tonight. I really do believe this governing body needs to take a hard look at these contracts and also evaluate the, the size of the cabinet. We're clearly not there as a collective board, so I'm gonna have to vote no, but please do know it's nothing that's performance-based. You are great, thank you. Okay. Okay, yeah, Jen. So as we know, I've been going over the budget, and one of the things I ran around my campaign is looking at reducing um, district cost and seeing if we can combine jobs and job titles. And Dr. Rodriguez is working with me with that and providing me with um, job descriptions for everybody and looking and seeing what we can do. So as I did before last time, I will be voting no and it's nothing personal. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Aye. So it's um, five, two, five, five, two. <laughs> Can I just put say that? Mm. Okay, 9.1, and this is gonna be exciting too. This is the Youth Truth Survey Results and Safety Plans, report by Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, thank you very much. So I only get a portion of this time, so I'm actually going to be doing the Youth Truth survey results, and then following up from that will be um, Kristen Chouse, who will be talking about the Safe Schools plan. Um, so we have quite a bit in this action item. Um, so one thing that we had talked about is a, when we came up before, we talked about the Healthy Kids survey. And a lot of us were very interested in the Healthy Kids Survey, but there was a couple of problems with the Healthy Kids Survey. One, it didn't cover all grade levels. Two, it was not every year. And three, it didn't include our parents and our teachers. Um, and so because of that, we committed to saying, we wanna hear from our community and we wanna hear on a consistent basis. So it's not just every other year at fifth, seventh and ninth grade level. Um, and so because of that, we did so. So we did hear over from 12,000 um, PVUSD community members. Um, the majority of them were our students. Um, so this isn't available for K-2 students. So this is only available for grades three through 12. Um, you will see that because of that, we had about 80% of our third through 12th grade students um, take the um, survey. Most of that was because they did it within class time. And um, so that's why we got such a good, um, a good um, um, attend, you know, rate on it. Um, we did not, and I met and spoke with the DLAC on this, um, we did not get a good um, parent um, response rate. So we only had 926 parents um, that took the, um, took the survey. Um, and most of them were from the North County. Um, so the South County um, was not well represented for the most part. Um, so this is something that we do need to work with our principals on, um, and we'll talk about it a little bit in the, in the future. We did have about 1,000 staff members and take it. Um, that did include um, both certificated and classified staff. Um, and so when you look at the survey topics, you'll see what's highlighted in light blue. Those were the things that are commonalities. Um, and so you'll see that for the most part, um, we talked a lot about engagement, culture, and relationships. And then for family and staff, we talked about communication. Um, we did talk about school safety for both students and families. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what our results were. So you do have this, if you can't read it, it is online for you, but um, we're kind of known now around here for our one cheaters. And we talk about the one cheaters because um, people's 
really ability to sift through large reports is sometimes their desire to do that, not their ability, but their desire is limited. And so we're really famous with doing one sheeter. So what you see on this first page is really talking about celebrating our strengths. Um, what you'll notice on students and staff is that 31 of our schools, which is all of, all of our schools, 31 of our schools um, were um, able to complete or had enough students and staff to complete the survey. Unfortunately, we only had 20 schools that had 15 or more parents that responded. So that's a problem, right? When you have 11 schools that couldn't even get 15 parents to do it. So as we, um, now that people see the, what actual information can be provided, um, then we're, we're gonna make sure that more and more people do it. Um, what you'll see is the areas of strengths was for students was relationships. Um, that was actually mirrored when I did my listening sessions. People said that they um, felt connected, they feel um, heard by the people that are around them. Parents talked about engagement and staff talked about engagement. And you'll see um, one of the um, comments or, or quotes that was there. Now when we look at our opportunities, the reason why the it, youth truth is good is because we're gonna do this for three years in a row. So what we're gonna be able to do is we're gonna be able to track progress, right? We're gonna be able to look at um, by what we're doing, do perceptions change and do they improve? Um, so what you'll notice, and I should have been a little bit more explicit, is where it says 25 out of 31, that means that 25 out of 31 schools beat the national average. So we don't want to just be in the 20th percentile. We don't want that. We want to be above the 50th percentile. So these are percentiles, meaning that no, not everyone can't be at the 100 percentile. So it's the bell curve, right? And so we want to be on the other side of the bell curve and beat that. Um, and so you'll see that students in grand, grand majority of the schools really feel um, relationships and connected. Um, and you can see the others. Now for, I mentioned that because now for students, um, it was a little bit different. It, it's kind of the same, but it's labeled a little bit different. For the elementary schools, um, a lot of the elementary students were saying um, only one of the 16 schools um, was above the national average in this area. And basically, they were, you'll see for both elementary and middle, where it was six out of 16, it talked about academic rigor and about really having to think hard and work their hardest to get good grades, right? And so um, that's something that, you know, we're going to look at, consider, um, you know, look at what their perception of that was and really make sure that we that are we're we're challenging our students to the level of which they believe that they can be challenged. Um, for elementary, it was um, for parents um, where we need to focus on is really feedback and communication. What they're saying is, I don't know where my child should be and what they should be learning at the specific grade level, and so we need to do a better job of communicating that. For secondary, it was around culture, it was around feeling valued um, at the school sites and feeling welcomed um, at the school sites. And then for staff development, you know, these are our district level warts, right? These are things that we need to work on um, as a district. So really providing the professional development necessary, so continuing to provide the support. So we've talked quite a bit tonight about good implementations of programs, right? Doing it right, providing the coaching, making sure that people feel supported in the work. So that's that providing feedback um, to staff. So remember, this is teachers and classified staff, so it, it's both. So having people, both positive and, and um, you know, growth areas, they want feedback, right? We all want feedback, we wanna know what we're doing well and what we need to improve on. And people are saying to us, we're not receiving that feedback from our supervisor. Um, and then also that they have the resources. So we know that for many, many years, um, we didn't have new curriculum out there, right? So now we have gradually been purchasing brand new curriculum as we move it forward. We'll be bringing the ELA elementary curriculum for adoption um, to you soon, right? So we wanna make sure that we have um, materials out there um, and able to support that. So I wanted to show you kind of how it goes with reading the graph. So 
the the key on this is that everything is averages, which gets skewed. So if you look, I'm just going to go for time purposes. I'm going to go straight to R scores instead. So if you look at the top score, this is on relationships. This was the high one, right, for elementary. You'll see what the district average is up at top. So the district average was 4.10, which was the 50th percentile nationally, okay? But what I want you to see is how, how it spans, right? All the way up from Rio del Mar, which is about as far over as one can almost get, all the way down to Landmark, right? So the reason why I show this slide is because we have to, as district level, differentiate for these scores, right? So obviously the schools that are on the right side of the 50th percentile are doing something much different than the ones on the left side of the um, 50th percentile, especially when you're getting down to like these bottom five that are there, right? So that's the elementary. And then this is just um, the exact same thing, but at the high school level, right? So high school, which is, was an interesting trend for us, is high schools, um, felt, for the most part, had better scores all the way around, um, which is not, which is sometimes um, not always the case. Um, but you can see, though, still wow. that it had, there's a significant difference between your highest score and your lowest, right? With high school, of course, we know, which is why some people choose that um, type of, of high school. Um, your, small, your smaller high schools generally did better in the relationship category right? So you have Renaissance that has a 15 to 1 ratio, right? So they, of course, probably should feel more connected and more relationship um, than when you're going closer to the 28, um, 30 to 1 ratio. Um, these are, so what we did is we have ratings for each one. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly show you. So this is what we're focusing on with sites. So each site, this is district, but each site is able to see their scores for students. And so you can see where they kind of ranked in students, right? Um, families. So if for high school, this was, you could see the difference between look how the students rated and the students actually rated pretty high. But then you look at the families and you can see that we dropped pretty significantly in a lot of areas, right? Mm -hmm. So then the question is, is, you know, what can we do about that and working collaboratively to try to figure it out? And then you can see staff. And you can, for staff, it was also the same trend. High school staff um, scored much higher um, in general than the other two areas, although the parents did not. But you can see, um, like, high school staff rated relationships at 72 percentile, which is um, really strong, right? So then you may say, okay, so what are you doing about this? So you have all the information, let's not just let this die, right? So kind of building off of what Maria had mentioned before is we wanna build off the identified strengths, right? So we wanna know what do we do well and then develop action plans to address areas of growth. Um, on March 14th, all the site admin, they've already received access to this for a while, a while ago, but they're gonna get additional training to really dig deeper into their data and then generate individualized plans, right? So what do we do with what we know? What do we keep doing that we know must be working because our scores are really high in those areas? And what do we need to do to um, support the lower? Then on March 15th, after everybody's received that, then we are um, with the lowest six schools, elementary schools, and the lowest um, five secondary schools, um, we are holding discussion with school with those schools that consistently scored low in all categories to provide them supports and just strategize. Say, okay, so we noticed this. Like, what did you think of yesterday? What was your individualized plan? And just give um, a little bit of different support. And then when Ms. Pettis comes um, back with the LCAP in May and June, then you will see some of those district-wide actions or those district-wide actions actually embedded in the LCAP. So that's what I informed the parents of DLAC as well. So you'll see that in there um, and move it forward. So um, it's up to you, President, if you'd rather go first to the safe school plan 
uh, or if you would like me to pause for questions on my piece and then go to safe school plan, what would you like to do? Um, I'll do questions on in case on your on plan my, first. Okay. Okay. So, is there any any questions from the board about her plan that she did? No. Comments. Okay. Well, sure. comments then. Comments. As far as the uh, parent involvement piece, I was actually pretty surprised on no more, you know, not more parent participation from South County. Um, so, are we currently looking at strategies that we hope to implement in the future to ensure that that changes? And if we are, I would like to offer some that I came up with. Okay, great. So uh, back to school nights. We mm -hmm. already have parents there, so mm -hmm. incorporating that as part of that. The annual parent conference, maybe having that as a piece, you know, a complete the survey before you break out to your workshops. Uh, we already have them there. That's 250 parents, right, from South County. Uh, Parent-teacher conferences, have that be part of what they do. Um, homework assignment. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, have them, you know, as you know, you, your signatures require, please complete this. Um, and maybe Kinder Roundup. Uh -huh. So yeah. those are just a couple of suggestions I have. Um, they're already there, so might as well, you know, engage them as much as we can. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of the same what Maria's saying, maybe the city could help us. Maybe we could partner up with the city. I know they do a, a newsletter. I'm not sure if it's monthly or bi-monthly. Maybe, you know, we can get on that newsletter and Great. ask for help. Um, or even on that same note, they also have after-school programs like flyers and a couple of others that I think, if possible, we may be able to to have that discussion at the uh, intergovernmental mm -hmm. committee meeting coming sure. up soon. On Maria and Danny, um, parents maybe have a site at the school because parents will sometimes walk into the office or do drop-offs, maybe have a computer set up where they can take a, the survey right there. Uh, might help. Um, maybe a lot of people d feel they just don't have easy access to a computer, mm -hmm. which might be a problem in South County. Maybe partnering with the library to get them that um, survey done. Great. All awesome suggestions. Thank you. So I did take the survey, and I don't have a super clear memory of it, but it was really long. I remember that, and many of the questions are asked in a different way, but multiple times, which I get because they're trying to validate the answers. But um, for parents working two and three jobs, just trying to pay their rent, I mean, it's just, it, it seemed like a lot, a long time. And if you want some sort of more qualitative comments embedded in there, which there were room for that, I would talk to the company who makes this and see if we can shorten it up and make it easier for parents to take the time to give you feedback, give us feedback. Thank you. That's a good idea. Okay. Okay, then, so then we'll move on to the safe school plan. Good evening once again. A uh, few pieces each year, the state requires the Board of Trustees to review safety plans that are being submitted. Uh, that's per education code. Historically, the county has issued us a template to be able to use that. Uh, what they found during an audit piece with the county was that that template was lacking certain functions that the state required. That required us as well as the county to move to a new system and platform. That platform is doc tracking, uh, similar to what we've used for SIPSAs and, and other pieces, and it is the state recommended platform at this point. So this year we embarked on that, moved to the safety plans being in DTS, doc tracking. Um, this process begins with school officials, law enforcement, parents, and it does a full review of what the safety plans look like. They come in two parts. The first part is basically looking at a lot of the board policies that govern the transactions that happen on our campuses, uh, which is the sample pieces that you have. Attached inside your board docs as well, you had one from each level, an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school sample. Uh, essentially, what ends up happening with the first part is those board policies that we discussed in terms of governing things like bullying, uniform complaint procedures, et cetera. Uh, I will say that we are expecting some alterations based on the board additions that uh, Mr. Berman's been bringing forward to you guys as well. So as those readings change and as we 
uh, complete additional board policies, those will alter as well. Um, so tonight, essentially, you're looking at part one. Part two is not disclosed to the public. That's not disclosed to the public because it really is our NIMS system. So it's that National Incident Management System. What that looks at is the routes that we have that we evacuate kids from, mm -hmm. how we get first responders onto campuses. We don't do that because it puts our staff, our students, and others in jeopardy during an actual response. So you don't see part two here. Uh, part two is complete as well for all of our schools. Uh, what we require, though, is staff recommendation for us to move forward with the process of moving these to county. Timeline-wise, what it would look like is we recommend approval tonight that these initial reviews go to the county by March 1st. The county gives us information and feedback from their perspective as well. And then we have an alterations period. Uh, part of those alterations we already know are going to occur. Uh, a lot of what Dr. Rodriguez presented this evening in regards to youth truth comes up in part two as well, which is looking at that climate and culture piece and really elevating our PBIS, our connections with students. We already know that that work is in place and coming forward, so it's gonna alter some of these plans anyway. Um, what we are asking though is recommendation from the board to approve the first draft reading going to the county so that we can get feedback from them. Our final hard deadline would be going to the state on October 1st. Our goal is to make sure that we have these done and closed out in June so that they're ready to go by the time we start in the school year. Can I have a motion? Make a motion? Are you looking for a motion? Okay, so we do need action on it. Yeah, it's an action item. Okay. Well, second. A second. Yeah. Okay, any discussion from the board? There's no So I'm, I'm just kind of confused. So it's under a report and discussion item, but we're voting? Yeah. Can I? This is what the county is voting? Correct. Yeah. yeah, so because of that, I don't think we are aware of that when we submitted it so we would need to ask for amendment to the motion and place it as an action item I apologize I make a motion to amend the item no no I don't think so who, who made the first motion? I did. Yeah, Danny. So Danny amends okay. his motion. Oh. Sorry. Oh, that's you, okay. Just point, point, point of order. Yeah. No problem. So, I'd like to amend my motion. We should make it an action item. Yeah. To make it an action make item. Action. And I will amend my second to make it an action item. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, discussion from the board. I mean. <laughs> So no no discussion. Okay, we're fine with whatever you said. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, all those opposed? I, I guess I would like to say one thing. I know that these templates represent a tremendous amount of work, and there's a whole like other half that we haven't seen. So I would like to thank all the staff. That there's parent volunteers, there's law enforcement who have given time to make this the best it can be. And so I want to say thank you to everybody who participated. Thank you. Thank you. It'll continue to go. We're going to continue to do this. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? Oh, we already voted. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 9.2 Local Control Accountability Plan. Up update on stakeholder input. Susan Perez. Good evening, President Osmondson, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Rodriguez. Um, as I think um, most of you know, the Local Control Accountability Plan is an important part of um, the whole local control funding formula. And it is something that we do on an annual basis. It is a cycle that we go through that really does last all year long and continues. And so as a reminder, the, the overarching purpose of LCFF is to make sure that we are starting with a student-centered focus on ensuring that our students are college and career ready, that they are successful, that we are then building our programs and our services based upon that vision and then aligning um, our funds to support that. And um, I think you've all seen this graphic that really does show our vision of all students college and career ready. Um, the goals that are listed to the right are actually our seven LCAP goals. Um, and then 
the core values at the bottom, but I really want to focus in on our seven LCAP goals. Those seven goals we have organized under three priorities. Um, under 21st century learning, we have four of our seven goals. Under high quality learning environments, we have one goal. It's a large goal. Um, and then under connectedness, where we really look at school culture and climate, we have two goals. The four goals that are under 21st century learning are number goal one, which is improving student achievement um, and access to A to G courses, completion of A to G courses, so that all students are college and career ready. Our second goal is to build those career technical education pathways, ensuring that students have choice to high quality pathways. Goal three um, is having those programs so that students can demonstrate an appreciation of the arts through access and choice. Our goal number five, which is also in 20, under 21st century learning, is improving English fluency for our English learners and then reducing the number of students who become long-term English learners. Under our second kind of big bucket, high quality learning environments, we have one goal. And that one goal is really all about setting the stage for learning. Um, it focuses in on ensuring that we have 21st century learning environments, that we have appropriately credentialed teachers, and that we have quality standards aligned instructional materials in all of our classrooms. And then the last area, which is connectedness, um, where we really look at culture and climate, we have a goal, goal number six, which is creating a culture where all our adults provide a safe, positive, supportive school environment. And our last goal is increasing parent involvement in children's education. So throughout the process, the year-long cycle, we are constantly gathering um, stakeholder input as we continually implement our plan, revise our plan, um, and then move forward to continue with implementation. So near the beginning of the year, when we start our stakeholder input sessions, we always review what our LCAP priorities are, what our goals are, what those actions are that we're doing within these priorities, and then what our results are. Um, with our stakeholders, we re review the highlights that we've been working on in the current year, and then we ask for input from the various stakeholder groups. And it is a very broad range of, of groups that we do reach out to. So here are some of the dates. We started most of our stakeholder input sessions in late October. Um, there are two groups that we are required um, in ed code to have multiple, um, bring the LCAP to several times a year. One is our district advisory committee, which is made up of um, representatives from all of our school site councils as well as representatives of um, special education students and um, foster youth. We have our DLAC um, and when we do our LCAP stakeholder sessions with DLAC we also invite representatives from our migrant program. We gathered input from leadership, we have our community group and these are our community partners, our district community partners um, who will come together. And then when I submitted this, um, we knew we would be bringing leadership from PVFT and CSEA in. We have since identified some possible dates and are moving forward with having those scheduled in March. Um, through the fall, through October, November, and December, we held stakeholder input sessions for the school communities at every all of our schools. And we had those out at various school sites and schools joined together um, to host those sessions. And this month, March, is my favorite month because it's student input session. Um, and so Friday morning, I will have our, our um, elementary students in this room. A couple weeks later, middle school students will be here. And then I'm right now putting together all of the high school sessions. And the high school's a little different. Rather than bringing representatives here, I actually go out and I meet with the leadership classes and with at least one econ gov class because those are all seniors at our comprehensive high schools and at Renaissance. And those are always um, enjoyable and very enlightening sessions to hear what all of our students have to say 
um, with how they believe we are doing in helping to prepare them to be college and career ready. And um, the next steps at this point, after we com finish all the stakeholder input, will be to compile and analyze that. And then what's really important is that in addition to looking what other, all our stakeholders have to stay is looking at our results. Our student achievement results, um, we'll be looking at things like the Youth Truth Survey, um, the um, Healthy Kids Survey, so looking at all the different data that we collect and um, there will be some revisions to our LCAP likely, um, but we are in the second of a three-year LCAP, so they're, they're not going to be major revisions. Next year, we will be working on a complete new rewrite for a new three-year LCAP for the following year. Um, after we do revisions to our LCAP, we then bring those revisions back to both the district advisory and DLAC, and they have a review and comment session. Then we bring um, that, there, any feedback from them that we may add into our revised LCAP, we bring that to you typically in early June and there is a public hearing combined with sharing the draft LCAP with you. Then it comes back to you for final approval late June and we need to submit it to the County Office of Education by July 1. And I'm just a tiny, tiny bit over. I gotta beat Chris next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and this is not an action item, no. 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 Um, this is a discuss. Mm -hmm. So, um, so is there any public speakers? No. Okay. Any questions or comments from the board, Georgia? Hi, Susan. Hi. I, I just love seeing how you light up when you talk about the input you get from the students and community. I've heard, listened to you say that for over two years now, um, and I know you really do enjoy that input. Um, for our new board members and as well as for community members, could you um, let inform us officially, like how the selection of that student input is, you know, how you get that, what's how the students are selected? Oh, sure, part sure. For the elementary, Yes. The middle school and the high school, and that in what schools it encompasses. Is it encompassing all elementary? Every all single right. school. So um, now I do want to clarify that um, charter schools have their own LCAP, so they're not part of this, the development of our LCAP. But for all of our other schools, at the elementary level, um, Friday morning, every principal will arrive here with two students um, representing their school, and the students are supposed to be from the top grade that the school has. So the Aptos schools will bring a six, couple of sixth graders. The Watsonville schools, for the most part, will have fifth graders. And um, it sort of looks like a little model UN. And they all have their name tags, and they're representing their school, and they're so proud. And they're very quiet at first, and then before long, they realize that they have a lot of the same concerns. And by the end, they're all talking with each other and sharing ideas. And um, it's just really a neat experience. Same thing with middle school. The principals will bring two middle school students from each, from all six schools. And then high school, um, we do go to a leadership class and then to an, a government econ class because um, I found the first year that the students who signed up for leadership were students who really did want to be leaders at the school. And by going to a 12th grade government econ class, we got students, the voice of students who perhaps wouldn't be leaders in the school, but we still wanted to hear from a broader um, cross-section of students. And then um, we felt it was important to include Renaissance, to hear from students who, for whom they felt a comprehensive high school wasn't the best setting for them. And, and how, how, did they do, how do you do it at Renaissance? I go out and I meet with them as well. So when I go to the with the student groups, I have a short presentation and then um, we have gradually gone from having them share out and I'm writing everything down to um, we do a presentation and then there's a question posted and they all have electronic devices and they go in and they fill out their, their input. Oh. And this time um, principals at the elementary asked me if I would give the students the questions ahead of time so that they could talk to their peers and so I'm anticipating they will come with um, answers prepared this, this year. And oh, cool. So Susan, and could you just elaborate, how do the principals of these schools select the two students that come to represent? At elementary? And, and at middle school, because I think you said it was two and two, right? Yes, it is. Um, I believe, 
and I'm not absolutely certain of this, but I know that a number of the principals have told me that they've brought students who are part of their um, student council and their representatives of student council. I'm not absolutely certain that is the case. Every time I allow the school, I let the school determine how they will select students. As long as they're from, I want students who've been at the school for a number of years so that they can um, represent more than one grade level. <laughs> Do you want to ask? Yeah. Um, in the in the future, sometimes the um, the parent nights for the LCAP feedback aren't super well attended, and I feel like in the past when we've done auto dialer, it reminds parents like, oh, there's something going on tonight that I want to give feedback to. I'm wondering if we could implement something like that again to get more sure. participation. I I'm not certain that parent that schools haven't used that but I'll absolutely suggest it we also have the parent survey um, on our website we have on our district website we have an LCAP page um, and that also has a survey for parents has the little presentation it has a survey so that if parents can't go to a parent evening they can go to our website it's in English and Spanish and I actually forgot to mention earlier um, that our teacher survey goes out Friday, and that will be open for two weeks. We do that every year as well. I have a question. Um, is there a way to email um, that survey to parents? No, I don't, so. don't know. I'm honestly not sure. If you have their email address, yes. I would, yeah, I guess if we have their email, I mean, if we have their email address for sure, I'm just not sure how I guess we do it at quite a few of the sites, so sure. Uh, I think that would be good. Um, and are we allowed to attend the student input sessions? I would love to do the elementary. Oh, you would enjoy it. It is at 10 o'clock Friday morning in here. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that's And then me. my other question is, as part of the elementary level, do we include transitional kinder, like our early, early kids it or even parents? Oh, at the, you mean in the parent sessions? Mm -hmm. The entire school entire. community is invited, yes. Okay. How about students from our transitional kinder? Um, at, oh, f you mean to the student session? Yeah. And the student session is for the top grade level in the school. Got it. So we okay. wouldn't well, have students that young here. Fifth grade, fifth grade, okay. yeah. So they will be the fifth grade. Sorry, grade. I missed that. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And how, how did you say what, where's the parent input happen and all that and how to, how to have? There, we do parent input sessions at the school sites um, throughout the fall and the principals advertise those sessions. We provide the presentation, members of cabinet come and do the actual presentation and at the school site. School, every single school? Um, we do not go to every single school, but every single school is included. So neighborhood schools tend to get together. So they, we allow them to choose how they will group. Okay. Um, for example, the Aptos schools over the years have started going as feeders. I know, I think this year a couple of other schools did feeders, but there's typically th three schools that will cluster together okay. and host it. One of the schools will host. And then all three principals will send the flyers and, and reach out to their parents. Okay. And we'll hold it at one school site. Cabinet members come and do the presentation and then facilitate um, the gathering of input. What we do is we'll do a presentation on the district's LCAP and then the principals will take their parents into separate rooms to have a continued discussion so that they're giving input really specifically at, to their school. Oh. And we gather all of that input. Oh, so that's good. So, so, so principals are really working hard to get parents there. Obviously, I mean, principals are in charge, if you will, in charge of working to get parents to come. Yes, they are, and our parent ed team um, also helps yeah. support them with that oh, outreach. Ed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> okay. Any more questions? No? No? Okay, where, where am I? <laughs> okay. Okay, um, where are we? Clean energy jobs. Okay. So 9.3, um, looking forward to this one too. 
It's the California Clean Energy Jobs Act Prop 39 Energy Update. So good evening, members Joe of the board. Joe Dominguez. Superintendent okay. Rodriguez, as requested by the board, uh, was to provide an update for our Prop 39 energy uh, uh, projects throughout the district, and we have some very positive news. Uh, one of the uh, main components was outside lighting and also interior lighting. So for exterior outside lighting, there's the list of the schools that we were able to accomplish, uh, ranging from Aptos High, uh, PV High, Renaissance, Mar Vista, EA, EA uh, oh, Hall Middle, Freedom. Uh, we replaced all the outside uh, exterior lighting with LED uh, retrofit kits and or new fixtures, um, approximately $820,000 uh, cost. The annual savings is a little bit over 100,000. And the PG&E rebate it was 191,000. Um, and we worked with the technical um, energy efficiency uh, consultant in partnership with PG&E. Um, the goal, and this is the annual um, energy savings, so this will be ongoing. Um, and the intent for the PG&E rebates that we get from the uh, PG&E is to reinvest that back into other projects that are solar or energy efficiency. The inside lighting projects uh, included all our high schools, uh, Cesar Chavez Middle and New School. And that project for the inside interior lighting was about 1.8 million. And the annual savings is 133,000. The PG&E rebate for that was a little bit over 100,000. Um, based on the rebate that I mentioned earlier, um, we're looking at other uh, sites that we can look at for the upcoming summer. We also completed an energy or site-based audit. So what we did is we listed all our sites in the district and where is the largest energy consumption. And that also includes uh, our other sites, such as our maintenance yard, transportation, et cetera. And so uh, reviewing that audit, we're making sure that we do the work where we have the most usage, so how to uh, gain additional savings. Uh, Watsonville High, the other component of Prop 39 energy efficiency uh, program, is also looking at older units within our district. And so we have a lot of old um, HVAC units, both heating and cooling, and also boilers. And um, the components range from, I would say, 40 years and up. And so really addressing those. And so we had some furnaces in our district um, and that were back in the 60s. And so we replaced, installed 32 condensing furnaces uh, which had a high rating of 97% uh, energy efficiency. And here we have about uh, about $10,740 uh, combined savings for um, all the various buildings that we were able to do at Watsonville High. And the cost was a little bit over $1.2 million. Um, so there's more work to be done, but this is a huge accomplishment for Watsonville High School. Cesar Chavez, uh, HVAC, uh, was 14 furnaces. Um, they were 48 years old. And we replaced with fur uh, furnaces that were 80% efficient. Um, the challenge and the difference between an 80% or a 97% is the uh, infrastructure, uh, where that includes the piping, plumbing, et cetera. So sometimes the units aren't able to be compatible with what's already established in the building. So we have to go with another system that's compatible with the infrastructure. And so, but we were able to increase uh, 80%. And we had to install duct uh, socks uh, to do that. And our annual energy savings is a little bit over 2,400. Um, also included within the Prop 39 energy uh, savings uh, initiative through the state is also our charter schools. And so this is a listing of the charter school uh, projects throughout our district. Uh, Diamond Tech, Lynn Scott, uh, Wixa, and we're able to enhance those sites as well. And also exterior and interior lighting uh, at the various sites. Um, so we've been very proactive, and uh, as I mentioned right now, where we're at now is looking at what sites we can accomplish for the summer and for the outgoing year. And we also have a meeting set up for P with PG&E to look at uh, further rebates and then also look at um, uh, any solar uh, type initiatives um, throughout the district that we could qualify for. We did also receive in 2018 the Energy Watch uh, Energy Champion Award, and then we also received the 2018 Air Resource Board Energy Conservation Award, and that was a huge accomplishment from our uh, facility staff and us as a district. And mm -hmm. so we were one of the highlighted districts, and we made 
uh, statewide news on that one. So wow, that sounds that. really good. Thank you. Oh, Joe, you might have questions. You might be okay. ready there for questions. Okay, T Kim. Kim first and then you, Jen. So Joe, just for the um, public out there who might not um, know, because these numbers that were spent are, you know, a lot of money. So does that money come through the state in the form of an award or a grant? So the state awards districts throughout California that qualify under the uh, Prop 39 Energy Savings Act. And so it's state funding. Um, districts are required to use those funds only on energy uh, retrofitting or energy efficiency projects. Um, so there's strings attached and we maximized uh, those funding. And were we eligible for more funding than what, what I just saw there? I mean, is it sort of an uncapped? It's, uh, the state has a, a maximum and we did receive the maximum that we could obtain. Um, there's also a conversation of how the the state is going to extend the program moving That's forward. Great. Okay, thank you. You're Good welcome. News. Yes. Jen. Yes. Hey, Joe. Um, first of all, this is a. It's wonderful to see that we're we're taking you know action on greening, you know the energy mm -hmm. use. Like seeing these reductions are are, are fantastic. Um, in terms of the longevity of the projects, at what point? Like, how long do we expect, mm -hmm. like the the new systems to last? Will there be a point? where we're seeing, I guess if it's all Prop 39, I guess there's not an outlay from the district, but um, when does the money savings that we have from energy, when does that outpace the cost of the projects? It varies uh, depending on the, the project specific, but uh, for example, the um, retrofitting exterior lighting to LED lighting, mm -hmm. that's an immediate cost savings. Mm -hmm. Um, and LED, LED lighting um, housing units outlast traditional lighting. Um, it's implemented into our deferred maintenance plan. So rather than changing out the, the light bulb, uh, say every two to three years, now we have a five to 10 year lifespan. So it's um, dependent on the specific project. And some of the furnaces that were replaced uh, enhanced our energy efficiency consumption, a you know, minimum of 80%. Those systems last a little bit longer, maybe 20 years approximately. So each one's are very dependent, um, but we do have a plan in place to make sure that we forecast our deferred maintenance budget for the upkeep for short term and long term. Thank you. You're welcome. Georgia. Hi, Joe. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so I just also wanted to clarify with regards to the Prop 39 and all the sites you showed us up there, that only pertains to school sites, so it does not pertain to like our transportation department site, the school district tower site, is that correct? Correct, and the one for the outside lighting, we did, we're able to qualify for the transportation yard. Um, just other, for the outside. Uh, yeah, other, other than that, all the other ones, based on the requirements of the state, it have to be a school site. Okay, but that's good for transportation because they really need it. I correct. mean, they we have drivers out there in the dark in the morning and at the end of the evening, so it's particularly this time of year. Um, so the second was, so not the district, um, but we did see some charter schools in there. Not, I mean, when I'm saying not the district, not the towers building, but we did see charter schools in there, and we do have school sites here on this location. So there's no, so I don't the, know what the, I, I want to use the word wiggle room there. I mean, that doesn't fall into that because it's at the towers? Yes, and that's kind of the uh, next step that we're looking into because uh, one of our charters is housed here. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the, what qualifies for that. So that's one of the next steps that we're looking into as well. And what about our adult ed program? Because we have, I mean, a lot of night classes there. I wish, adult ed does not qualify, qualify under Prop in 39. the Prop 39, right. okay. okay. And then, okay, my last one, I promise. So um, are, are there any matching programs like through PG&E to match these rebates? PG&E does have uh, several programs. Um, one of the components of the rebate program that they have structured is the more uh, energy efficient a system is, whether it's the lighting or a furnace or a boiler, mm -hmm. um, the more of a rebate we get back. Um, there's also an incentive in, you know, w within our fiscal department and um, in facilities is reinvesting those rebates back into the program so that we can also complement any other PG&E program that they may have. 
uh, to enhance that. So we're working on that as well. Great, glad to hear it. Thank you for your good work on You're this. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. Um, oh. oh no. Okay. Um, so I was just interested. Do we know about? Well, a couple of things. Do we know about the savings that we have received from all the places that have solar? Do we know about those kind of savings? I mean, do we could we put those in in numbers about the savings that we're receiving from our our schools with solar? That's what I was thinking. Yes, that's the the next step that we're looking into is we're looking and compiling um, our utility costs uh, district wide, and that's part of the the in partnership with PG&E and the audit is to seeing if what's the reduction of energy usage. So, yeah. So I I know you know I've talked to. Dr. Rodriguez about this. I know we're we're going to do, she's saying, uh, once we get the okay on the towers in terms of, you know, we're buying it, we're buying the towers, that we do the roof and solar at the same time. We put a roof on and we do solar at the same time in the towers. Yeah, yeah. that's what it, Michelle's, Dr. Rodriguez is talking to me about, doing so roofing and solar. So one of, the th one of the um, opportunities we have as a district is looking at, uh, based on the energy efficiency audit, is looking at energy consumption and uh, the towers being one, uh, but what are there other sites out there that have a high consumption of energy and where can we put, uh, you see other neighboring districts that have carports, um, that are solar panels, but they're, always, they're used as carports, shade structures, similar to the one we have at uh, Watsonville High, mm -hmm. behind the football field. Um, so there's and other hall opportunities. Hall, yes. Hall so we're looking at that. We're looking at rooftop, et cetera. So a lot yeah. of opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Anything, Danny? You want no? Okay. Um, okay. Then the last one. So I think we're done, right? No more. No more comments. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, this is the first reading of new board policy. Michael Berman again, <laughs> 0415 Equity. Hello again, um, President Osmondson, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, once again, with federal program monitoring coming next week, um, we're continuing to take the opportunity to review our policies um, and ARs and updating the policies based on the passage of various bills. Um, this is the first read, so there will be no vote this evening. Um, the second reading um, will be in the next, will be in, and the vote will be in the next board meeting. So please let us know um, any feedback or changes you may wish to make to Dr. Rodriguez the Friday before the meeting. This one is um, board. It's a new board policy, um, BP zero four one five, and it's it's a policy um, regarding equity specifically to express the district's intent to proactively um, identify class and cultural biases as well as the practices that impede equal access to opportunities for all students. Yeah, I saw that, that's good. Okay, any questions from the board? Okay, 9.5, first reading of policy update, BPAR 6171 Title I programs. And this is also um, based on some updates to Title I programs, federal stuff, um, federal funding, um, specifically um, more detail about supplementing and not supplanting, and the LCAP um, additions to Title I policy. Okay, any comments from the board? Okay, 9.6, first reading of career technical education, technical education BPAR update. And this one is based on new federal laws, um, specifically PL 115-224 um, and also AB 1808. Okay, whatever that means. <laughs> okay. Um, would you care to speak to what, what that means? Like what? Yeah. For the CTE one? Yeah. Um, we have Rob Hoffman here who has more details on it. Do you have questions about it or do you want me yeah, to? Yeah, what's the new regulation? Yeah. Hello, everybody. The AB 1801 bill. 
he was using a bunch of numbers and we just wanted yeah, to maybe so the, maybe the superintendent. So the amends, so the AB, um, sorry, it's the PL 115. This reauthorizes the, the Cal Perkins, the federal grant for Cal oh, Perkins. Cal per Perkins. Cal Perkins, Perkins grant. You know, you know that the better. Cal Perkins. And uh, retitled it of strengthening for career technical education um, for 21st century uh, learning the act. And then the AB 1808 uh, one amends the California Career Technical Education Incentive Grant Program. <laughs> so both are grant funded um, federal funds. So the CTIG, Cal the CTE Incentive Grant and the Cal Perkins Grant. That we can get. Yeah, we do, ha yeah, correct. That no, we can get, yeah. Okay, yeah. any more? So I think two new requirements that I think that are very important for us is one, it requires us to do a needs assessment. And now that we're taking over our own program and that becomes very important to us. I mean, we had to do the program or the policy regardless. And then second, it does require something that um, we hadn't done in the past because we weren't in charge of the program, but it requires us to do a district-wide catalog and administer that catalog to every single student. So technically a student within our school district, let's say they're at D Diamond Tech, um, they have the right to go to um, Watsonville High for a CTE course. And so it's all about making sure that every single student, secondary student within the school district knows what's present at all the other schools. So I just wanna note those two items um, that I think are significant in the new law. Thank you. I, I have one question, Rob. I'm not sure if I should direct it to you or to Superintendent Rodriguez. Uh, do you feel that um, that these changes are are happening and being affected by you know s lobbying from CSBA and NSBA at the federal level? I mean, where do you feel that the, the changes are being stemmed from that we're adopting to here, or, or that I'm sorry is on the first reading tonight? The changes you just right. spoke to. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, you want to say comment? Yes. Sure. Well, I think a lot of these um, new regulations is coming due to the increased amount of federal and state funding that's coming down. So one of the things that's been that mostly at the state level they're talking about is accountability for the use of funds. So that's kind of where you get the needs assessment coming out. That's kind of where you get the insurance of equity that all students have equal access. So I would say that it's linked to, and LCAP is um, doing a lot of this too with the accountability, is so the we're infusing all this money in the system. Well, is that money making an impact and is it making an impact on many students? So I believe it's coming from the legislature with them acknowledging we're giving you money, so therefore you need to be accountable for those funds. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, 9.7, first reading of policy PBAR 5111, admission. And this one is due to the new law AB 699, which you've heard me say a lot, and that's specific to um, immigration status, social security um, mm -hmm. numbers, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Means that, that they can't require them. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, any comments from the board, questions? Okay, um, now, okay, you're done now, All Michael, right. again. <laughs> See you <laughs> Thank next you. time. <laughs> See you next time <laughs> for the second reading. Okay, 10 is the consent agenda. So these are routine items. Um, can I have a motion for the consent agenda? Somebody give Making me a Making a motion to approve our consent agenda tonight. I'll second. Okay, is there any items the board wishes to defer? No. I will call for a vote. All in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Um, now we're gonna do closed session. We can hurry up and do it before <laughs> 10 o'clock. Huh? Okay, closed session, the one, um, the one so under expulsion. Item, sure. Under mm -hmm. item 2.1, I move to approve the recommendation of the district administration for a full expulsion of the remainder of the 1819 school year with placement at another school site outside the district 
and a suspended expulsion for the fall semester of the 2019-20 school year with placement at another school within the district on a strict behavior contract for number 1819011. Okay, should I say that? Okay. Okay, now Danny to the closed oh, I, session. I, did we vote on closed session? I, I don't believe we did. Or did I miss the vote? Um, did we vote on I mean, I don't think we did. Okay. So um, I, I all, just made okay, a all those in okay. Second. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay. I, I'd like to make a motion on a closed session item two point two. I move to approve the certified personal report as presented by district administration on February twenty seventh, twenty nineteen with hundred and fourteen with thirty eight additional action items. All those in favor? Oh, 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 do I have a motion? <laughs> Scar, a sorry. Motion. We need a second. I'll yeah. second. Okay, oh, now all those in favor. <laughs> Aye. 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 <laughs> motion number two on the closed session, item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on February 27, 2019, with 49 with 12 additional action items. I'll second. Okay, first and second, right? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 There's two more. Um, resolution number 18-19-24, be it resolved that this is the Governing Board of Trustees, hereby ratifies the decision of the superintendent to send notice of non-reelection in accordance with the Education Code to all employees whose identification numbers are 7014, 2581, 7505, 8172. And readout number two on resolution 18-19-25, be it resolved that this governing board of trustees hereby ratifies the decision of the superintendent and district administration to issue notices of possible reassignment and or release of certain certified management employees in accordance with the education code for the following employees as per employee identification numbers 8524, 9826, 6713, and 2097. Do you have a motion? Voted in okay. Closed session. Uh, oh, on that one, closed session. Okay. Um, no, no. The only thing I wanted to say is that April, t our April tenth special board meeting topic will now be the Brown Act. It's not going to be on some of the other stuff, the dashboard stuff that we're going to talk about before. We're just going to have the Brown Act to be our special meeting on April tenth. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, our upcoming board meeting will be March 13th. Um, yeah, our next scheduled board meeting, March 13th. Everyone, thank you, and we're adjourned. Boom. <laughs>